first, my apologies for getting here late. I'll call this meeting to order at 6.06 .06 p.m. Get a, get a roll call, please, Ms. Johnson. Trustee Garrett, present. Trustee Otrepenti. Trustee Salahuddin. Here. President Lee. Here. President Tahada. Here. Student Trustee here. And Student Trustee Abizaraya. Here. Let's see, so do we have any changes to the agenda? Yes, we do. Um, I'd like to move discussion item D to the last, the final discussion items uh, of F because we have county council coming and she is going to be here late. We want to make sure it's sort of as late as it can be in the agenda. Okay, which discussion item is that? Discussion 10D. What's the name? To 10F. Board meeting COVID procedures. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. So with that amendment to the agenda, do we have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Mm -hmm. And do we have an approval of the minutes? Move to approve the minutes. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Now for the student of the month from Thornton High School. Marenka? Dr. Marenka? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Members of the board, it's nice to see you all. Thank you for having us today. It's a great honor to be here today to help honor our student of the month for Jefferson Union High School District. Before I get started and read a couple of quotes and then turn it over to Nathan, I just want to give a shout out and uh, honor and recognize our Thornton staff and those folks that are here. <laughs> this is part of the team that has helped support Nathan and Nathan through his own efforts is now one of our early graduates as well. So All right. congratulations Ooh. for that. I also want to recognize Mr. and Mrs. Murillo who are here with us as well. Thank you for your support. As a standout soccer player, Nathan shows excellent sportsmanship both on and off the field. His can-do attitude is appreciated by both peers and staff alike. He truly represents the stellar characteristics of a model student athlete. Mrs. Morales, Nathan's 11th and 12th grade English teacher, says, Nathan is a great blessing to our Thornton community and to anyone who knows him. I appreciate his kindness and respectful attitude, as well as his teachable spirit and willingness to help others. I will always treasure his daily good morning, Mrs. Morales. How are you doing today? And our conversations about life's most important topics. Nathan carries special gifts and will no doubt continue to bring positive change wherever he goes. I will miss him when he graduates from Thornton High School. Ms. Gaines shares, she's our school social worker, echoed the sentiments of Mrs. Morales, and she shared that he has been so kind, respectful, and thoughtful. Nathan has worked hard to get where he is today, and I know he will be successful in whatever he chooses to do in life. He is an inspiration to those around him and exhibits great maturity, along with having empathy for the world around him. Mr. Neville, Nathan's math teacher, had this to say about him. From the first time I met Nathan, I knew he would be successful. And by the way, this was during the pandemic. Nathan always had a positive attitude and excellent class attendance. In math class, I remember him first saying, I will never be good at math. Yet as time went by, Nathan picked up the challenge and was always curious about topics covered in class. As a senior, he realized that math relates to the real world and can actually be fun. On a personal level, Nathan and I often spoke about our mutual love of soccer. Now that Nathan has graduated high school and is headed to college, I'm sure he will be quite successful. I encourage him to study something he enjoys and to take full advantage of the opportunities made to you. Through perseverance, determination, and a positive attitude, Nathan has captured the elusive victory from within. 
He is well positioned for much success and has been an honor and, it, and has been an honor to share with Nathan's journey. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Nathan so that he can read something to share with us all. I just want to say thank you to my staff, to my family for saying those nice things about me and helping me accomplish what I'm doing right now. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nathan Morello, and I'm a graduate from Thornton High School. A little background about myself is that I have a great family and great friends. I enjoy playing soccer, and I'm currently playing club soccer at the moment. I'm Salvadorian and Honduran. My plans for after high school are to attend Skyline and major in subject related to sports. At the moment, I am considering kinesiology. During my free time, I enjoy watching soccer, especially the English Premier League. I also enjoy walking my dogs. I mean, yeah, my dogs. My family has two Huskies. I have one brother that is currently attending Westmore High School and plays basketball for the school. My family and I used to live in South San Francisco where I attended South City High School with all my friends. When I started off, when I started off as a freshman, I was only getting five credits every quarter, which meant I was only passing one out of six classes every quarter. And things didn't change as a sophomore. During my time at South City High School, I didn't make the best choices. Things were not looking good for me at the time, with both academics or personally. I was get, as I would get a lot of detentions, referrals, and school suspensions. Because of my low grades, I was not allowed to play on the varsity soccer team, which was devastating to me at the time. <clears throat> then the pandemic hit, and I, continue, and I continued to struggle during online classes, and I really had no other choice but to go to Baden High School, which was another continuation school to be able to even think of graduating. But then my family and I moved to Daly City during my junior year, and I was required to attend Thornton High School instead. I had never heard of this school until the district called my parents and told them that I needed to attend due to my lack of credits. However, I was excited for this opportunity as I wanted to begin working on myself and begin making better decisions. When I became Thornton, I immediately enjoyed it and having school online was welcoming. I shout out Mr. Neville, as he was the first teacher I spoke to, and he introduced me to the school and what to expect. I also met with Ms. Gaines and Ms. Talkoff, and when I first started, they made, me, they made me feel very welcomed and told me just about everything would be, and told me about everything about Thornton. And I, something just told me that something, something just told me everything would be good here. Then to my amazement, I started getting good grades during online classes at Thornton because my teachers were also helpful. And when we finally came in person, my teachers were just as helpful and they motivated me to do all my work and independent projects. Thornton has changed me to be a more mature and responsible person who completes all my work and someone who does not make dumb decisions. And I can say that I'm graduating early for all the hard work I put in, but if it was not for the teachers and staff, I would have never been in the position I am right now. And for this, I am grateful. And I want to shout out Ms. Morales and Ms. Alejandra and all the staff and all the teachers for helping me. Because without them, I really wouldn't be here. And I thank you all for listening, and I hope you all have a great day. So at this time, I'd like to open it up to the board if you'd like to and, and to our student trustees, if you'd like to say anything to Nathan. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say something real quick. Again, it's really nice to see all of the teachers and staff that are here at Thornton High School. Uh, Mr. Morello is a testament to all the good work that you all do at Thornton High School and continue to do. So thank you for all you do there. And, and continue to do to support all the students. So, and congratulations, Ethan. Job well done. Thank you. Yes. And the same thing, just to echo, I'm trying not to get weepy. <laughs> uh, that was a fantastic speech. Thank you so much. It really just, uh, you know, it really uplifted me to get through the rest of the meeting today. So, thank you. And then um, my sister uh, has her degree in kinesiology, and um, she was a coach at Skyline, um, and now she has her own um, gym 
she owns her own business, so it's a great degree. So I suggest that she goes through that. That's good. She loves it. Yeah, she loves it. Yeah, yeah. She opened uh, a gym in the basement of her house, and so she has people come in there and has her own little small business. So she absolutely loves it. So if you want to, I can connect you guys. I can connect. So if you want to, I can have my sister talk to you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And then again, to the Thornton staff, like, I can't say enough positive things about you. you. You guys are always such a great family. You always roll deep, and I love it. So thank you guys for all the work that you do. And again, thank you, Dr. Marenko. Fantastic. Right here, this is what it's about. <laughs> Come on now. I mean, this is, this is just awesome. This is, this is it. I mean, we're about life change in this district, and, 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 and what the Thornton team did for Mr. Murillo is just outstanding. This is, this, is, this is why we're here. This is why I do what I do. And I'm just great, so grateful to be able to be here, to be able to support the work that we do as a team and that especially you guys are doing to, to do life change for so many of our students like Mr. Murillo. And I'm so excited. And do not, and make sure you take her up on her offer. You've got to do it because it's, it's, it's awesome. <laughs> so again, Thornton, you can continue to have the bar way, way up here for all of us. And the lives that you've impacted has just um, year after year after year. It's so inspiring. And Mr. Murillo, you're going to do great in college because that speech you gave was so honest and heartfelt. And you were able to project and engage and you're so inspiring. I am so inspired by you. And this is the way, I, really, this is the way to kick off this evening. Because it's going to be a long one. And <laughs> to have you here and your family and the Thornton family here, it's so inspiring to help us do what, why we're on the board. You're, you're the reason for that. And your success is our success. And I don't take, really take any credit for that. I have to give that to you because that's you. It comes from inside. And just for what, oh, you, there's, it's endless. Your, your future is really, the possibilities are endless. And please keep us posted on what you're doing and when you open your own business. <laughs> so, so thank you again. Oh, yeah. Go right ahead. Thanks. I, you know, there really isn't anything that, hasn't been said, but I just wanted to make sure to tell you congratulations. Thank you. It was really nice meeting you the other day, and I'm super proud of you. I know you're, I'm sure your, your family's very proud of you, and um, you really represent Thornton and our district very, very well. So good luck to you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Picture time. If I oh, may just yes. Make, um, so th Nathan... <laughs> On behalf of Jefferson Union High School District, Thornton staff, we'd like to present you with the Jefferson Union High School District Student of the Month, Nathan Murillo, Thornton High School, March of 2022. And again, um, just, I just want to give a general thank you, uh, members of the board, the executive cabinet, Thornton staff. Um, Nathan and family, this all isn't possible without all of us pulling together. So um, the success that Nathan has, of course, he did all of this on his own, but it's as a director as all of the support you give the Thornton community. So thank you very much. Very grateful to that. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's very nice to see you again. I'm doing well. How are you? Good. As usual, the people all right, here we go. Ready? One, two, three. Congratulations. All right. Congratulations. I know. Congratulations.
Congratulations to you, too. No problem. Yes. Congratulations. You got it? Yes, of course. Don't you want to see our dog cheer? I do. Yeah. <laughs> I think our dog cheer. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. Okay, okay, okay. Come on, come on. Come on, Ms. Lequire. Come on, Ms. Lequire. Okay, here we go. Okay, um, we will be Nathan or Car Works Club. Okay. Okay. Everybody, we want to be Mrs. Green and Nathan. Congratulations. Well, we need a board chair. <laughs> <laughs> that seals it. We're walking out there to steal that one. Necessary, but now. Gotta do it now. We need the perfect chair. We'll start rehearsals next week. <laughs> Every school needs to come up with one. <laughs> okay. Communications. We'll start with our student trustees for your board report. Um, so for Oceana, recently we had interim fair because interim is coming up. And so um, we did a whole fair. We raised money and sell food and a lot of clubs and interim um, raise a lot of money. And the only thing I, only other thing I have to report, I think, is that senior exhibition presentations are coming up. Thank you. So um, I think, yeah, last week for International Women's Day, there was like a little event in the quad. So like students could write like on a post-it, who's a woman they most admire. A lot of students wrote their moms, you know. Um, and then also if they wanted to, they could also be in like in a video and answer that same question. And um, yesterday for Pi Day, um, a lot of the STEM clubs at school got together and like had an event um, after school from 3.30 to 6. And I think that's all I have to report. Mm, great, thank you. Missing Garrett? Oh, I don't have anything to report to me, but that was a lot of excitement there. Yes, there is a lot of excitement. <laughs> that's all I have to say. I'm going to tell the student of the month and Thornton here, so thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't have anything too. I know we have a lot <laughs> on the agenda. Yeah. Yeah, there's, yeah. Mid, mid month, I don't have anything to say. Let's just keep rolling. All right. Um, I will say that I attended um, the return of Mission Fusion. It was so exciting. Jefferson High School, I was able to see my daughter perform on stage for the first time in four years at Jefferson. She's never performed there. So it really um, warmed my heart. And also, I'd like to say that we had the 100th anniversary of the celebration of Jefferson High School on March 6th, 26th. March 26 from 11 to 3. So come on out. Ms. Presta. Okay. Um, I want to also uh, kind of tag on to President Tejada's praise of Mission Fusion. It was an amazing show. I know we were all there. Every, you know, lots of us attended. It was just an amazing, amazing show. Um, and just really proud of Jefferson High School. Um, so I want to thank start off by thanking the students at Westmore High School. Graciela Olata's art, Olate's art class um, has given us this beautiful, this beautiful oh. installation. So I wanted to call attention to that. Thank them for that. It's wonderful to have students' artwork for us to um, appreciate. Um, I also want to thank Thornton for inviting me to the career, the career fair last week. It was a great experience. Um, I got to talk with two different classes, and I'm just I was really impressed by um, by the questions that the students had and their engagement, and it was just really fun to be there. Um, student advisory last night, they were really productive. We had a really good meeting, so a shout out to all the kids that give their free time for our district. Um, and other than that, just looking forward to Senior X next week. Nope. Now for the AFT local fourteen eighty one report. I'm not going to have a report. Okay. Great. Can I have a report? 
Okay, mm -hmm. hey, Mr. Ochapinti. Excuse my latest traffic coming across commuting today. Um, so, um, one, um, good to see everybody here today. Um, one, I uh, wanted to note as the mask mandate is nearing an end in many places, we know that in our schools um, that the masks are still necessary. So point of order, this we're, this time is for non-agenda items. So the mask, is, that's the COVID is on the agenda. Yeah. This is the board report. Yeah. So it's for non-agenda items. This is the board report. So right, but it's it's but board report is for not non-agenda items. We're not supposed to talk about items that are on the agenda before it comes up. I've never heard that rule cited before in seven years on this board. Just so reading, but yeah. thank you, yeah. thank you for for yeah. Um So I just want to note um, one as the mass mandate comes to an end. This is a very important issue. Obviously, we've spoken to again. Um, I just want to note that uh, in my experience teaching too, uh, many people are asking these questions. I want to reassure that our students, you know can, of course, wear the mask, and our students know that um, there should be an expectation that we are providing everything we can to make sure that we finish this semester strong. So um, first and foremost, that as we're navigating the rest of the semester, despite any other uh, rules and regulations that we'd be considering for the safety of our students, we should be mindful of those who are most vulnerable in our community. And so that's the first thing I want to say. Uh, I think it's important to say. Um, in terms of recent events, I know um, in our last meeting, just to address some of the issues that were brought up, um, one thing I noted that I think is relevant, we'll be talking about to a degree, um, is public comment. Public comment is, is important. It's a vital part of our public processes. Um, in essence, it is why we hold these meetings. This is not a meeting for the district simply to discuss district business as administrators or as public officials, but it's for the public. This is our, this, these meetings are meant for us to conduct our meetings in the business of a school district for the public and with the public, including our students and families um, who may not always have an opportunity to see or hear about these issues. Um, it is good to hear people from the public. I, I appreciate the honesty and I think even just people's opinions regardless of where they're coming from. That said, um, it is disappointing to me to see um, that our board has without discussion, certainly without any of my input, um, move to remove any virtual public access for our community to be able to participate in our meetings. Um, our job, a large part of it as public officials, is to actually foster and encourage civic engagement. When we are telling the public that we are no longer offering them an option to attend or participate in our meetings virtually during a pandemic that has not ended yet, whether we are in an endemic stage or not, is extremely discouraging and also disturbing to me as a public official to see this decision has been made without my consultation or any of that from the public who have been participating in our meetings. I will note too that um, on YouTube, we do have many viewers in, in recent meetings, hundreds. Um, so for those who are watching, um, I will advocate that we, <clears throat> that we continue to include virtual comment, um, regardless of how other trustees feel about civic engagement. Um, it is part of the democratic process. We need to make sure we extend every opportunity to hear from our public on every issue of import and certainly those that relate to public education. Um, that said, uh, one of the things I noted was that there are several items in the agenda here um, that we'll be discussing that require public comment. So I find it odd that this meeting of all meetings will be the first meeting where we no longer have access to the public to make comments given the controversial and highly um, important nature of these items. So I will question the leadership of whoever's decision that was to decide that we get rid of public comment when most major cities and school districts are continuing to provide a virtual option through call-in and non-identifiers in alignment with civil liberties and civil rights that this board and this district have refused to recognize despite my bringing up the issue and many people on public comment in the community. So, just to note that, best practices, um, as noted by many organizations, including the ACLU, and just best practices and governance, like many of our fellow public officials across the state of California, um, I would encourage us to return to providing a virtual option for our community so that we can have full comment from our students as well who have been prevented 
from participating because of that until maybe recently, until we have maybe three meetings left in this school year. And now the board is considering, um, the other members of the board are considering providing that access for students, but then saying we can't do the same thing for the public. So to me, there's no logic, but it's a clear political bias based on the issues here that are in fact working in the private interest, in my view, and not in the public interest. Because if they were, we would have the public here with their input and during public comment, both before and after these items. So I would encourage a continued review of our governance practices here in alignment with actual public policy and best practices. And beyond that, I'll reserve the rest of my comments for the items on the agenda. Thank you. Ms. Salhoudi. Um, I mean, I think, <laughs> so a lot of that was not correct because the board didn't make a decision about this. The, the, if the board can only make decisions in board meetings. So there was no board meeting where that decision was made. It was a uh, memorandum from our county council. So that's one thing. And then the other thing is that you're saying we're not allowing public comment. There is public comment in the same way that there was public comment before COVID. Um, so just a clarification on those things. Um, I will say that that I do find it challenging um, to be, to have the board called out when we are the board. So we are all doing these things. So you're talking about the board like you're not a member of the body, we are the board. And so um, I would just, I just wanna put that reminder out there that you know we're a team and we should all be working together uh, for the best interests of the students. And that's why I became a board member. Um, and that's what I will continue to do. Really? I've got nothing more to add. Yeah, I have nothing to add as well. Um, <clears throat> I had already given my report. Yes. Okay. So we're moving on to consent agenda items. Move to approve consent. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Let's see. Discussion items. So for a dis uh, oh, do we have any public comment? I don't have any cards. Okay. Uh, discussion items. Start with our student advisory council update. That's the presentation. The presentation. Mm. Uh -huh. <laughs> Musafa, did you want the control, or did you want to ask Mr. Mr. Meyer to go ahead? Okay, if I control it. Can he have control? Sorry. Absolutely. Oh, here it is. Do you want to come up here or stay there? You can stay there. You can go if, there. Okay. Go up there. They're coming. Either way, it works. Either way. You're on camera better if you're there. Yeah, yeah. actually. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. See? <laughs> they want to come out of the oh, whoa, you blew. <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> Good okay. Choice. All right. Good choice. I was thinking the same <laughs> thing. Oh, it's right. better Good there. Choice. You know, no. Close to the exit. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's all yours. All right. um, good evening, everyone. So I'm just going to present on like the what the Student Advisory Council has been up to and some requests for what the district and the board should prioritize. So. How do wait? I just it's like on the right arrow. It's not working. Is it on? Yeah. Oh, is it on? It is yeah. on. Oh, oh, there we go. Okay. Um. So first is the communications committee. So one of our goals was uh, for this year was to be more active on social media, and not only um, build a stronger connection with students and. Um, get more student opinion, but also update the general student body on the board's progress so that they know that there is um, that their concerns are being addressed. And so we also started posting 
um, the superintendent updates, and we take turns posting and answering questions on our stories that we ask for, and we also answer questions that we get directly on the social media. Um, so these are some examples of something we post, and we try to do it as often as we can. Um, next is the nutrition, com uh, nutrition committee. So um, the concerns are that they are unsatisfied with the school lunch quality and that they would like more funding to improve it. Um, and that's kind of the same thing. So that is kind of, um, those are some examples of the food that was taken um, at the beginning of this year. And a survey was conducted at Oceana in the first semester. So I have some information. Um, so we got 150 responses and 78% of those responses um, always or sometimes rely on school lunches and 58% asked for more protein and 42% asked for more vegetables and fruits in their lunches. And just to like explain the picture, so <laughs> the first one is like a multi cheesesteak, but that is not necessarily an issue with our like district. That could probably be like where who's like supplying it. So, and then the one on the right is a marshmallow salad. And I guess the concern with that is this was served at Oceana, but if I'm correct, it hasn't been served since, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the main issue is that, like, just that it was served. Like, we, like, why is kind of the reasoning? Like, why would you serve that? I don't know. The mix just seems a little weird. But, yeah. And then just like a recap of the main concerns. So, like, the lunch quality needs to be improved. And, like, specifically when it comes to portion sizes, because certain lunches, like, the portion size can be, like, really small like small be like a cup kind of thing and that can be an issue for students who whose only meals may be at school or students who need to stay at school for a long time so like they need to be sustained for like a longer period of time and then there's limited options for students with dietary restrictions so whether that be like students who don't eat meat or students with allergies and if we could improve that like that would be like appreciated and then also, when it comes to like being healthier, like we know that they meet like legal standards for what should be in a school lunch, but having more fruits and vegetables, as those foods do sustain people for a longer period of time, they're just more beneficial to student health. That is something that should be like prioritized. And moving on to our last area of concern is the environmental committee. So the goals of the Environmental Committee are to have compost and recycling at every school. So I can just speak at Westmore, there is a plan to have compost at, um, after spring break in the cafeteria, but it would be a lot easier if there was a centralized composting system because this is something that shouldn't be left up to the school sites to implement. It should just be something that the district has. I know like for example, San Francisco has had compost for a long time now and San Mateo County in general has been pretty behind on getting compost. And then incorporating environmental education into our curriculum. So like environmental sciences and AP environmental science. So again, that is like a bit of a site issue, but in a, like a more broad aspect, having like, you know, like a district group or like sort of similar to what ethnic studies has right now, like um, a team of teachers and staff members dedicated to like um, dedicated to like how we implement environmental aspects into our curriculum. And this can be not just into the sciences, but also, for example, like economics is hugely impacted by the environment. And even things like history, you know, climate change is a part of history, like even in the past, you know, when you think of things like the industrial revolution, for example, that is something that accelerated climate change. And then prioritizing sustainability at our schools. So trying to make our schools, you know, more green and like renewable energy. And again, just composting. Um, again, this is something that we know will take time to implement. So it's important that we start now as the data or the projections on climate change are very bleak. So, you know, having our school district catch up because we are kind of behind on this. And also just educating students on what is compostable, what is recyclable. I just will say like composting is more important than recycling because a lot of the things that we put in recycling don't get recycled because we just don't have like the resources. 
like a lot of places in California don't have the resources to actually recycle. So, you know, educating students on what is compostable, like a lot of paper products, you know, just because it's not okay to just have it there. You know, like, oh, we have composting. If you don't tell anyone how to use it or what's proper use of it, then it's not an effective implementation of compost. So we're just going to summarize everything for the committees. So communications, that is the committee where the Student Advisory Council does have a lot of control in terms of what we can do because it doesn't necessarily require funding for us to communicate with other students. So we are just trying to, you know, streamline educate, um, communications with students through whether that be like social media is our primary outlet right now, our Instagram, and, you know, just update them on district news because a lot of times there is an awareness and also confusion about what happens at the district level. And then for nutrition, again, school lunches, they should be healthier. And then our school lunch variety, you know, for students who have dietary restrictions. And for both environmental and nutrition, the nutrition committees, those are things that require funding at a district level. And I know that it's really hard for our district to fund things as well as we want to, but we feel that these should be prioritized for students. And then for the environment, having a centralized compost and recycling system at every school, and then incorporating environmental education to our curricula. So I elaborated that on that brief um, previously. And just something to, and like another thing to know is also having training for our maintenance staff because this change could be like, they're already like very overwhelmed. So we need to like support them if we hopefully go through with, you know, having composting and better recycling because we don't want to just change something and throw it onto them and give them a lot of responsibility all at once. Thank you. Any questions? Open this up to uh, Mr. Lee. <laughs> First off, I, I, I do want to commend you for the work on the JHSD Advise Instagram. I think that's been really great to see and, and to see the level of engagement that does come up. I know I, I see it roll up and I'm impressed with the information you guys put out there. So kudos to, to all of you for keeping that up and getting timely information out to, to the community as a whole. With regards to food, food always comes up every couple of years. You know, it, it's cyclical, but but it but it also speaks to the fact that it is probably one of the most important things that we have to do, have provide for our students. It's not the most important, aside from the education of your minds. So, yes, my question would be: what what sorts of things would you say you would like to be able to um, next in terms of next steps related to say menus and 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 the quality of food and the food options, would you say, is it something where students could work with staff to come up with menus? I mean, what, is that kind of what you're thinking? Um, so one thing I know for Oceana at least, um, what we have is a feedback form that where students can communicate directly with um, the staff that works in the kitchen so that they can figure out exactly what um, they want to be improved. So I know that's something mm -hmm. that's happening, but yeah. And on like the district level for the advisory council, you know, we're open to working with the director of food services. I don't know what the exact position title is, but you know, we're opening. Like, you know, sometimes we do have district employees at our meeting, and we can talk to them and ask them questions about things and like get updates on what they're working on, and we can give them feedback there. So we're opening. We're open to working with them. You know, we don't just want to have it be like here's demands. Right, mm -hmm. right, great, mm -hmm. thank you. Mr. Archipenti? Yeah, thank you for the presentation. Um, you know, I was looking at the one from um, last year and I was thinking about the ongoing issues in turning to in-person learning and the kind of things that students were talking about mm -hmm. before. And um, you know, remember we had a time where the school lunch was improving a lot to where there was you know, a higher demand and maybe even we had time to get in lines. And so, um, yeah, the more student input, the better, I think. Um, one of the things that we should be doing as school districts is not just listening, but integrating the input of students to help create the decision making in terms of like, what are the vendors? Who are the options? 
that way our administration and our site leaders, right, principals and anybody else, and teachers, you know, who can be involved in helping cultivate this too with the surveys and getting more input. Because it's hard for students to reach all students, but you do it better than anybody else, right? So we usually look to that. But I mean, in getting that input in, um, I feel like those are some of the most valuable pieces of data that any school board or any you know, public agency can work with. And certainly, whoever the vendor is coming in, they're going to continue to ask those questions. So um, if the person making, say, you know, a salad in that way was thinking that maybe they got a recommendation, right? Maybe somebody, maybe a student was like, hey, have you ever made this? And they might have thought, okay, why not? But then it wasn't on a popular recommendation, right? Um, there's always ways to fine tune it, right? So those are the kind of things. It should be an ongoing process. It shouldn't be just like, hey, we, we got somebody now. That's it for the next year or two. Um, your health is an everyday thing. We've learned that through the pandemic, right? And I think we should be mindful of that um, with programs like nutrition, especially. Um, my, uh, also, I just want to appreciate social media. I feel like um, social media is, is run by the youth, the younger generations, I feel like, in terms of just globally. Those are where the trends come from. And so people are listening. And so just to appreciate whatever you can do with social media, it's a lot of pressure being back in person. Of course, not everybody's plugged in online. So you have positive and negative experiences with social media. but um, it takes work. It's not always paid labor, right? It's not always something that people think about in terms of the time it takes, but social media takes a lot of time, right? And sometimes even in the classroom, um, as much frustration as teachers might have with students on their phones, a lot of times students are just communicating, trying to share information that does help our schools and our communities and our families. So um, thank you for that. Um, my question will be around environmental, which is really important. Um, one, just because climate justice is it's a global phenomenon, right? It's not unique to any one place. Um, though we know that the impacts can be at higher stakes in other places. And here in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, we are a highly urbanized and industrialized area, but we still have responsibilities, right? Composting being very important. It's one of the things I think um, if people haven't been using their composting boxes at home or don't know how to, then, you know, where do we start? And so uh, I think you're very right in that we can be doing that in schools. Uh, in fact, I know that Oceana with the agri-science program has kind of pushed that along. Student clubs, um, the Grizzlies Go Green at Jefferson, of course, at every campus. Um, environmental clubs at any level, whether it's a garden at the school, restoring native plants, recycling. And even here at Del Rey, we've had the garden, which was actually working with the County of San Mateo to do a composting education program for years. And so those programs have existed in the district. And so there's no reason why we shouldn't not only resume those programs, but in fact, invest in them and expand them and integrate them, integrate them across all our campuses, um, including Shasta who have been doing a lot of work here with the garden as well. And of course, um, I know with every campus, there are teachers who are dedicated to working for environmental mm -hmm. science. And um, in the years where we taught earth science more, that these things are more and more relevant. So again, um, just like ethnic studies, like you mentioned, um, I guess my question would be this is, um, where do you see the process in terms of, or where would you like to see the process in terms of student input on an environmental science course? Um, not just AP, of course, and getting something like that, but um, where would you want to be involved in that and seeing that we develop that um, as a student advisory council and at our campuses? So with the environmental science course, I think most sites have had it or some do currently have, have it in the past. I think that um, if I recall correctly, when I spoke to some science teachers at West, or when I asked one of my science teachers at Westmore, um, she said they were trying to work out to see if there was any way to get it to be like a physical science requirement because a lot of students don't like taking chemistry or, or physics to get that um, one-year life science, one-year physical science graduation requirement. So I know the discussion is being had at Westmore, and I think, does Oceana have an environmental science class? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think Terra Nova also has an environmental science class. So again, that was just more of like... Um, I dependent, like a site-specific issue. Uh, I'm not really sure where the process would go. Maybe expanding that, you know, offering an AP would be nice, you know, for students who are really passionate about environmental science, just going deeper, like understanding it on a deeper level. Um, maybe having an interactive sort of, it can be like a more interactive course, you know, whether that be like learning native plants or like a teacher gives their student a plant and like here, take care of this for a week and see how well you do. I, I don't know because I, I've never taken an environmental science class and I don't really know what they look like. But um, 
I don't know, there's a lot of, also there's some intersectionality between like biology and environmental science. You know, a lot of the sciences are connected. Um, so if a site doesn't have that, they could strengthen their biology class and maybe incorporate climate change, like a whole unit on climate change, you know, which I think might be a thing. I don't know. It's been a while since I've taken biology, so I'm not sure. I don't know. I was going to say, yeah. Did you all see? I was, I was just say that one of the, reasons, uh, one of the way, reasons why I ask is because we didn't have a chemistry AP class at Westmore when I was a junior. So one of you know, our friends you know, got a petition going and said, hey, if you want to sign up for it, the teacher's willing to teach it if we have enough students. And if we can make a good argument right to you know, the administration, then we can get it going. And so we did. And so I, don't think, I think it's very possible. What you're saying is, is very possible. And I would love to hear from more students in terms of um, the programs that are already going on at the schools and in terms of what they want to see from it. And um, yeah, it's very exciting. Thank you. Um, one thing I do know is that I think that a lot of us don't know that we can talk to our teachers about, like, oh, we would really like to have this class. And um, in academic council recently, I, I think that a lot of students came up to the psychology teacher and asked for an AP psychology class because they really, really wanted it. And I think that maybe if we if we told them like this is something, um, if you really want, talk to your teachers about it. Maybe they can help you um, implement it in the future. Yeah, that's a really good idea, and, and that's maybe a discussion to refer to, of course, administration to be able to explore at each of our sites. Because I know, like you said, many of our campuses are offering different kind of offerings in half, um, but the students um, should be ha should have a say in that. You have a strong voice and agency in that. So there's definitely a process. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, I don't know if I have questions for you guys since I haven't been to a meeting in a while, but I did hear a lot of the discussion. I think it's more around just direction um, that uh, I know lunch has been an ongoing challenge. And so it would just be nice to have, um, have a discussion about lunch at some point. And then to talk about, since we're getting reimbursed for lunch, um, like can we invest more money? to see if we can upgrade the quality um, and just have that as part of the lunch LCAP budget discussion. Um, and then the other question that, or the conversation that I wanted to talk about was the environmental sciences. I know that there has been, it's, you know, depending on the site, whether they offer it or whether they offer the AP. But I'm also wondering, because with the CTE discussion is going to come up, if we could start looking at that for CTE as well. Um, because there's a lot of industry in there, um, especially around conservation. I know San Mateo County is looking into a lot of things, especially with the uptick in fire. Um, so how do we look at that as, as the educational, but also, you know, job prep? Um, and uh, I think those are all the only two direction comments. I, you know, again, I am very grateful for the work that the student advisory does on this and um, getting that connection and bringing the voice of students into the um, into our decision making process and helping us guide us in the um, direction so thank you both I want to thank you guys also um, it's been a pleasure working with you and especially during the pandemic when we had all our meetings over zoom and how you continue to um, keep it up and to, to make sure that it continues to flourish and not die. Um, what I, I think that we have, regarding the composting, <clears throat> I think that um, our maintenance and operations, Ms. Ms. Van Rapkors, that we, we've ordered our tribe in waste stations for uh, zero waste and You'll be working, uh, we'll be working with staff and students on training and educating on recycling and green waste over the month of March. And, um, and so what I understand is that we've been working with local waste companies because we have different ones in each city to have a full rollout after spring break. Is that still on time or? I, I know it is for Daly City. I'm not sure about Pacifica. I think we might have run into a little bit of a delay. Mm. Um, so we'll have all the bins for the Pacifica schools, but I think the um, bringing on the waste company is taking a little longer in Pacifica. But we should have it all rolled out in Daly City um, by the end of spring break. And do you know who'd be training the staff and the students? Uh, they're the actually 
from the waste come and okay. get confused with Republic. Like Republic, thank yeah. you. Republic um, is sending people to help. Great. Right. Yeah. Because I know that Grizzlies Go Green a few years ago had worked with them directly and they got a composting um, program up and running. But with the pandemic, it just kind of dropped away. Um, but it is, of course, you know, with our students, it's uh, foremost on their minds because you really take up the mantle when it comes to the environment and um, social justice, actually. I did, since I mm -hmm. got to talk, mm -hmm. I did have, maybe you and I can touch base after, or you could just speak to it now, but I'm not sure the difference between what you were saying with um, having composting in the cafeteria versus having it centrally located or oh, something. No, I was talking or about Or centralized, like, yeah. Centralized, I just mean like across the district. Oh, okay. I just know at Westmore, they're starting in the cafeteria Got because... It. I guess like start small because maybe students won't know how to use it initially or like just so that they can get used to it or like know what goes in the compost. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the reason why at Westmore it's starting only in the cafeteria. But you just mean not centralized, you mean district wide? Yeah. Okay. I think, yeah. I, I guess I was using centralized in the term of like how you mm -hmm. use it in government. So maybe that was wrong. But yeah. <laughs> I just yeah. wanted to make sure I understood. Got it. Yeah. So just like, not site-specific. Yeah, not site-specific. Right. Great. Thank you. No more questions. Thank you so much for all your work. Thank you. Yeah. Great job. Great, great job. Great presentation. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Our next um, presentation is Career Technical Education Program Updates. Ms. Baca. Good evening, President Tejada. Good evening, members of the board. Tonight, I would like to um, present Ms. Shreve, who is our CTE coordinator, who will be presenting updates on our Career Technical Education Program. Ms. Shreve. Hi, before I get started, I'd like to say thank you for having me tonight and providing the opportunity to um, present the updates with CTE and to showcase everything that has been happening in the last year and a half. So hopefully it's all work. There we go. Um, first, I'm going to present to you, go over what is in the presentation. I'm going to first talk about what is career technical education and our pathways and then provide a brief overview of the grant funding that we receive. Um, next, where are we now? So what is happening currently in our pathways? And then also talk to you about the enrichment opportunities that students have after outside of their courses and our partnerships. And then what are our future plans for CTE in the 22-23 school year? So what is CTE? Um, career Technical Education, um, also known as CTE, just so everybody knows all the acronyms, mm -hmm. um, provides students with the academic and technical skills, knowledge, and training necessary to succeed in future careers and to become lifelong learners. CTE prepares learners for the world of work by introducing them to workplace competencies and makes academic content accessible to students by providing it in a hands-on context. What is a pathway? A CTE pathway is a sequence of two or more CTE courses within an industry. So a pathway exists of a first year course, which is called a concentrator course, and then a second year course, which is um, known as a capstone course. For our students, a one year, there's a one year graduation requirement. So students are always enrolled in the concentrator. Um, as we go on in the presentation and look at data, we're going to look at our students that progress to that second year, that capstone course, and see how many are, are progressing. Um, I am happy to report that all of our CTE courses are sequenced and are a pathway, so they do have a concentrator and a capstone class. Um, why should students participate in a CT pathway? CT pathway programs offer students the opportunity to explore a career field of interest as well as learn valuable 21st century technical skills. Um, CTE Pathways offer students training in leadership, community building, industry partnerships, and work-related soft skills necessary for college and career. 
And how do we know that CTE courses prepare students for college and career? Because all of our CTE courses support the Common Core and CTE model curriculum standards. They contain academic and technical skills that are applied in a real world, hands-on environment. These um, model curriculum standards are rigorous, evidence-based, relevant, and reasonable in scope. So um, I also want to highlight our CTE website for all of you. Um, the website provides information to all of our stakeholders in our community on our CTE pathways and highlights what we are currently doing and our partnerships. So um, for those of you that have access to the presentation, you can click the image to enter the website, but I also put a QR code on here. So if you scan it, it'll bring you to our um, CTE website. So a lot of our funding is um, through grants. And when I first started in this position full time three years ago, we received two primary sources of grant funding. We received our Perkins 5 grant, which is our federal funds. And then we received the California Technical Education Incentive Grant, also known as CTIG, and that's our state funds. Um, since then, in the last three years, we have brought on community college funds, which are known as um, Strong Workforce Program K-12 grants, or SWP K-12, and you will see um, we currently have, um, we have been part of the San Mateo Consortium that has done four rounds of the Strong Workforce, and then ourselves have done two rounds. So um, we'll talk about that funding more in detail. Um, but what we need to look at to qualify for these grants, besides being able to provide match dollars, um, they follow the 12 elements of a high quality CTE program. And I'd like to just highlight our strengths and how we have um, met these elements in the last few years. Our strengths have been our path pathway sequencing. As I noted, all of our pathways have a concentrator and a capstone. Um, we also this year are beginning our Capstone Showcase project, which we developed um, during the pandemic online as a team during our curriculum councils and worked very hard on it. So we're excited to see that implemented this year and um, just bringing student leadership into our programs. And then also all of our CTE teachers are CTE um, credentials, so, which makes all of our programs high quality programs. Some areas of growth that we're focusing on is increasing our student participation in our work-based learning programs. Last year, we had 30 students participate in work-based learning and five go on to summer internships through that. This year, our goal is to have over 100 students participate in work-based learning. And that's um, starting up in the next couple of weeks with our partnership with Pilot City. And then um, our other area of growth within the 12 elements is just our industry partnerships. We've made very strong connections with the County Office of Education and with um, our community college partners, but now we wanna be able to bring in more industry professionals. And then um, some other grant qualifications are that when we look at how to spend our grant dollars, we're looking at data and allowing the data to drive our decision-making process on how we should spend those, those dollars. And another thing is that funds from these grants need to be used for CTE-specific pathways. So to go over the grants, and I don't want to mm -hmm. overburden everyone because it is a lot of money, but um, I just, and it can be quite confusing, but I just wanted to highlight where we're at with our funding on a yearly basis. So um, on average, we receive about 90,000, anywhere from 85 to 90,000 per year from Perkins, our federal grant. And this supports our students learning English support um, professional, which is new this year. And I'll talk about that a little more. Um, it also supports our professional development with, for our CTE teachers, going to conferences, um, attending workshops. Our Future Business Leaders of America, their um, competitions and that student organization and then materials and supplies and industry certifications for our program. And then our CTE incentive grant this year, we received $242,000. Um, that supports our industry standard equipment, 
um, part of my position. Uh, the CTE capstone sections at one section at Westmore Jefferson in Terra Nova. Um, field trips for students and our work-based learning contract with Pilot City. And then we also, as I mentioned, now are a part of the Strong Workforce Program grants. And round two is specific to the engineering pathway at Jefferson High School. And we've used that money to create the maker space there and um, purchase industry grade equipment. It also covers the section, one section of that program and then field trips. And um, the other strong workforce grant that we have at Jefferson Union High School District is our middle school college and career grant. And so we are having a pass to success event this Friday actually at Skyline College. So it's helping our eighth graders see the connection between high school and our community college partners. We'll, there'll be 125 eighth graders attending that event on Friday. And um, also middle school field trips to our campuses to see what's on our campuses and tour that marketing materials. And it also provides funding for CTE counselors. So there's one section at Westmore Jefferson and Terra Nova for CTE specific counselors that help with dual enrollment and um, just providing guidance for students on career technical education and the connection to the community college. And then, as I mentioned, we're part of a San Mateo County consortium. And within that con consortium, we have three grants. Um, round two, which is 63,000. Um, it will be ending this year. It's for college and career awareness for our students. And that supports our next step events, which we do in partnership with South San Francisco Unified School District. And that's coming up in April. And the support and marketing material for that event and transportation, of course. Mm -hmm. And then the other one is the round three is about increasing equity and access and dual enrollment grant. That grant will be starting in the fall. The work for that grant we've been planning this year and it's gonna provide racial and equity training for CTE staff. And when I say staff, that includes teachers, counselors, and administration, anyone that has anything to do with CTE um, will attend that training. And that's in partnership with Skyline College as well. And then the dual enrollment course materials. And the last round, which we were just granted, and um, it is working in partnership with our elementary school districts and our community partners and South San Francisco. It's about radically reimagining re pathways to opportunities for historically marginalized communities in San Mateo County. And it's really about um, providing funding for work-based learning programs, community CTE development and marketing. And we're working very closely with the Boys and Girls Club on this grant. And just um, for next year, these are the grants that we will have. Um, we were just awarded $450,000 in our CTIG. So that's double the amount that we've received in the last couple of years. So we are very excited to receive that award amount. And then um, our Perkins application is due in May and will be awarded in summer and then our continuing strong workforce grants that I had just previously discussed. And just to give you a little data overview, I wanted to see, um, give you the opportunity to see the growth that we've had in CTE over the last three years. So our pathway offerings pretty much stay consistent because that's what we have at our schools, but we have introduced two new pathways this year. Um, aerospace Aviation Mechanics at Westmore and Building and Construction Trades at Thornton, which I'm very excited about. Last year, the feedback when I presented was, um, how can we get CTE at Thornton? And we listened and we made it happen. And I'm very excited about that new program. And um, we've also had some additions and courses because we've added those capstone courses to our program to make sure that they're all sequenced. So out of the 14 pathways that um, covers 35 courses across the district. And of those 34, 35 courses, 29 are A through G approved and we'll be submitting three additional courses in the spring this year, by the end of the school year, which will bring it up to 32 courses out of the 35 are A through G. Um, and of those um, 16 of our um, 
35 coursers are dual enrolled, and that really speaks to round one that just ended last December of Strong Workforce. We were able to use that money and also um, strengthen our partnership with the San Mateo Community College District to offer more of our CTE courses being dual enrolled. And when that happens, if a student takes both a concentrator and a capstone course, and it, that capstone course is dual enrolled, now they are um, college and career ready on the California dashboard. They've met that requirement. So um, I'm hoping next year to even have more of our CTE courses dual enrolled. And, um, and then as I mentioned, when a student completes our pathway, they are known as a CTE completer. And three years ago, we were at 110 students in our second year programs. And this year it's estimated that we'll have 218 students completing the second year pathways. So, um, which is very exciting number, but also a lot of work for our capstone showcases. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, Another area that we like to look at is our special populations and our, are we meeting their needs? And we're not. Um, we're working towards it and it's our definitely our focus this year. So um, as you can see, our students with disabilities, only about 5% are going on to be completers. Our students learning English, 3.6%. And our socioeconomically disadvantaged um, around 16 to 20%. Um, that if you look at our um, percentage of students that are represented in our district, district-wide, we're not there. Um, and because of that, when we looked at the data this year using our Perkins funding, we used it to provide a section of teacher support. Um, so Lisa Rubin at Jefferson High School provides that support to our CTE teachers district-wide and meets with our teachers during their collaboration time on their prep periods to help provide support on how they can engage the special populations more and provide that support in our first year classes. Because we know they're enrolled in our first year programs, but we want them to take our second year courses and to continue with our program. So, we're um, trying different strategies to increase those numbers. And then just some highlights. Um, we have a new culinary teacher at Jefferson, Mr. Scott Sachs. He's doing wonderful over there. Um, they are starting their cultural project in this week, so Thursday, and then it'll continue for the next eight weeks. Our digital media, this year I, I spoke with Ms. Lewis and Students have submitted their work to the student Emmys, and hopefully we'll have a winner. And, um, and then as Ms. Tejada mentioned, Mission Fusion and the work that Heike does with the dance program, um, nobody can come close. <laughs> and, um, and then the new makerspace and engineering program at Jefferson is flourishing. We're seeing growth in that program and the robotics team. So, and unfortunately I had a video of the dance class, but it doesn't seem to want to load. Mm -hmm. But, um, so that's what's happening at Jefferson. And then at Terra Nova, um, we have the journalism program. They had a guest speaker come in over CTE Awareness Month in January. Uh, Mr. Schneider continues with the stagecraft and drama department. They are planning to have a spring production um, well, you know, like everything in the past year, it's all determined on where we're at with COVID. Um, our woodshop program at Terra Nova is the strongest CTE there. It has the largest enrollment this year using funding. We we're able to have a new desk collector installed. So that's that beautiful um, piece of equipment there. <laughs> and um, and then uh, the picture of Mr. Smonetti with a female student in Woodshop, we always like to see when um, typically you think of male students in Woodshop, Mr. Smonetti has a large amount of um, female students and we like to see that and encourage that among our female students. And then we also have our automotive program, which is dual enrolled through Skyline. They just recently went on a field trip with all the other automotive programs in San Mateo County to Skyline College. And then at Westmore, um, the top picture is our new aviation program within our transportation pathway. Um, we've partnered with AIM, which is Aviation Institute of Mechanics in Oakland, and they are providing um, training and hands-on 
um, examples for our students and mentoring. And then we have computer science, fashion, our manufacturing pathway has a brand new fab lab, which if you haven't seen it, go take a tour. It's amazing. Um, and then our business pathway there, which I'll talk a little bit more about because they are a highlight with future business leaders of America. So, and then I, I put Oceana in, in here because there's is dual enrolled and it's taught by a Skyline teacher and CT is not a requirement at Oceana, but students do receive CT credit when they take this dual enrollment class at Oceana. And then asynchronously through Skyline, we offer a health science pathway to all the students in the district. As I mentioned, it's asynchronous. And so um, we're, we're happy that we're able to provide that. And then lastly, Thornton High School. So we are offering it. Students are receiving both CTE credit and dual enrollment credit when they take this course at Thornton High School. And Mr. Lopez is teaching it. This is a picture of the greenhouse that they are building. Um, I was there last week and it's actually almost complete. So they're shelving and it's all closed in now. So I can't wait to see when plants are in it and what happens next. And one of the other things that we really wanted to look at and use our grant funding was to promote and honor our CTE students. So every CTE student starting last year who completes a pathway receives a silver cord for graduation. And then um, the video showed our new banners. We have new banners in all of our college and career centers highlighting the pathways that are offered at that school. And then that's our table that was at all the eighth grade nights and open houses with our notebooks and banners to encourage enrollment in CTEs and um, allow our community to, to know what we offer and that um, there are certificates and other degrees out there than four-year colleges. Um, so one of the 12 elements is not just about what happens in the classroom, but what can happen after school and the enrichment opportunities for students. So we started a Girls Who Code Club this year, and it's um, Jefferson and Westmar are doing this program together. So this was a day in the new makerspace at Jefferson with both girls front and female identifying students from Westmore and Jefferson. And then our future business leaders of America that Mr. Pham advises ha, um, has won competitions at both the local level, the state level, and are going on to the national level. So we're very proud of all of them. Um, the Mission Fusion, we're back on stage this year. It was a great um, performance by them. Both Westmore and Jefferson have robotics teams that compete as well. And then um, the Digital Media has their Grizzly News. And we had a student this year, Nicole Sang, who did a summer internship with Pilot City. And I'm going to try and play her video here. Hopefully it'll work. Um, she did an animation, and she just received a $5,000 scholarship from the San Francisco 49ers. Oh, wow. is our future. He's already asked me, when does it start again? When can I do my work-based <laughs> awesome. learning again? So. That's awesome. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well. Mm -hmm. um, I already mentioned Nicole. So she's in our manufacturing and product development pathway at Westmore. And Noemi and Victoria head our Girls Who Code Club. And I, they were going to try and be here tonight, but they weren't able to. But we do have a little clip of them. My name is Nicole, and I'm a senior at Westmore High School. And um, Nicole, what have you enjoyed about the CT programs that you've been involved in? Um, well, I guess 
uh, what I enjoy the most is like working with my classmates because like they're pretty smart and like we're like helping each other like we solve problems together and um, over like the semester we're able to make a container like from nothing to actually something that you can uh, carry and like hold yeah and um, you learn like 3D design and manufacturing, you know, how to uh, use a machine and stuff. And then, um, what do you think you've gained from the CTU programs, from being involved in Mr. Levine's class and Pilot City? Um, that you, I is, think, go ahead. <laughs> well, um, from uh, CIM, which is taught by Mr. Levine, um it's mostly like skills and like problem solving skills um like as i said we're like we made like container and like uh basically like knowledge mm -hmm. about like um manufacturing and for pilot city um i was an intern at a 3d animation company and that like I feel like that internship got me more into like the industry, like understanding what the industrial industry standard is. Thank you. And then lastly, what has made you feel welcome, supported or valued in your CT program in Pilot City? Oh, definitely uh, my teacher. Uh, <laughs> he's super um, helpful. Like he will um, like provide like office hour after school sometimes um, and my classmates like we help each other and so yeah great thank you so much for your time Nicole we appreciate yeah, you no being problem. in with us today and now I'm gonna bring Noemi and Victoria they both attend Westmore High School as well and are the president and vice president of the Girls Who Code Club so Noemi and Victoria, if you can unmute yourselves and introduce yourselves. Hello, my name is Victoria Chan and I am currently a junior at Westmore High and am a president of Girls Who Code. I'll give it over uh, to Noemi. My name is Noemi Hang, also currently a junior at Westmore High School and vice president of Girls Who Code. Today, I'll be talking in detail about the Girls Who Code. Girls Who Code is a nonprofit organization that aims to support and increase the number of women in the STEM program. It also creates a safe environment for women to pursue their own interests in the program. We have collaborated with multiple clubs to support the same goals we have. Recently, we did a collaboration with Hack Club, which allows students to learn how to code and for those who have experience with coding, learn more complex and abstract terms and solutions. Uh, Girls Who Code help the Hack Club connect with outside resources to further expand both clubs and help achieve both of their goals. Throughout the club experience, it has been extremely difficult, but with the help of my vice president, Noemi Hang, as mm -hmm. well as our great advisors, Mr. Levine well. and Mrs. Shuri, uh, it also been, it has been eased. Mr. Levine has been a wonderful advisor as he commits a lot of effort and time into his clubs and especially Girls Who Code. He tries to guide us with ideas and help provide all resources to supply to supply us with our needed um, stuff for meetings. So Victoria, how has your experience in Girls Who Code prepared you for after high school? Uh, it definitely for both Noemi and I, we want to pursue our careers in computer science. We want to major uh, computer science in UC. Uh, UCI or UC Davis. So it really prepares us of what we want to do and we learn a lot from coding and networking and such. Yeah. Great. And then Noemi, I'm going to ask you one last question. Um, what has made you feel welcome, supported, or valued in Girls Who Code? Mm -hmm. I feel like the teachers, they're honestly very approachable and they're very experienced in their teaching. Thank you, um, Noemi and Victoria and Nicole, for once again being here with us. My so, name is Nicole, and I'm a senior uh, at Westmore High School. 
And I am excited that even though they weren't able to join us in person tonight, that you were able to hear the student voice because I could tell you all everything about our program, but it's really about the student voice and the student experience. And um, Nicole and Noemi and Victoria really speak to how we are trying to um, connect our um, students to the next step in their post-secondary um, journey and and help them and guide them in that. And then um, some exciting stuff. We are now featured in the Pathway videos for San Mateo County Office of Education. All right. They'll be premiering in <laughs> April. So here's some of our students being interviewed for those Pathway videos. And then, as I mentioned, our Capstone Portfolio Showcase, we had our first one in December because now that Jefferson's on the 4 by 4 some of our students completed their pathway in the fall, and we had 60 students present during that day, and we had community partners there and industry partners. And these are the five domains that our CTE completers strive for, our <coughs> global citizens, communicators, industry ready, problem solvers and critical thinkers, and leaders in our community. Oops. And then this, as I mentioned, is our event coming up this Friday in partnership with Jefferson Elementary and Skyline College. It'll feature Claudia Sandoval. She's a master chef, and she's our keynote speaker for the event. And then um, our next step event is going to be on April 22nd. Here's our Skyline panel from last year's virtual one, and that will be happening um, on April 22nd. We will have 100 students from our district and 100 from South San Francisco there. And then our goals for the next school year is to strengthen our pathways, as I mentioned, include more work-based learning opportunities and industry certifications, and increase our dual enrollment, increase our summer internships, and um, bring our Pacifica Middle Schools in. We have this event now for our daily city and we're able to partner with Jefferson Elementary. Um, the goal for next year is to partner with Pacifica School District and offer the same opportunities to the eighth graders in Pacifica. I'd like to end by saying thank you to my CTE team and thank you for, <laughs> to Ms. Baca for all of her support always. <laughs> I couldn't do it without her. So thank you. Thank you. And do you have any questions? Wow. Great presentation. I'll open it up to the board. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you, Garrett. Uh -huh. I want to say it was an honor to be at the um, advisory meeting a couple of weeks ago and hearing the presentation. I mean, just um, seeing the data showing the completers is definitely a testament to all the good work that you do and to show students there are other opportunities as well as um, getting a degree to be successful under other ways to do so. And I love the community engagement and just, you know, getting the community involved and, and helping to nurture and, um, you know, um, professionally help the students to grow. That way it's just really inspiring and, and shows that community leaders also want to, um, they also want to help, you know, help the students grow as well as, you know, Maybe want to hire them in the future. So it was really nice to see you. Thank you all you do, Denise. Thank You're you. fantastic. Thank you, Carla. <laughs> yeah, Miss Curry, too. But yes, yeah, I just love it. <laughs> I just love to, you know, that's kind of like my passion there. So I just love being a part of it. And thank you for letting me be a part of all the work that you do. Just a little bit of it. So thank you. <laughs> Go, Chipendi. Yeah. Um, thank you for the session. Just to echo that, I think... Um, one of the things I was looking forward to seeing and being back to in-person learning on campuses is a lot of what, everything is uh, using your hands, right? Everything's hands-on. <laughs> Whether you're working, you know, mentally, physically, I think that's one of the things in terms of what is vocational, what is academic. Everything involves work and energy. And so with CTE, these are some of the areas that demand a kinesthetic and a tactile intelligence modality that we're able to teach almost only, if not uniquely, in person. Yes. And so, you know, that's, you know, I turn, talking about learning loss and what that really means in terms of academic skills is one thing, but our students, our communities, our youth have, sur they're surviving a pandemic. And a lot of those skills um, translate into actual practical skills um, that will translate into not just academic or college, but college and career, which is both, you know. And so 
looking at this, anyways, I want to say that um, I'll be interested because a lot of this is good information. I don't want to you know, go too much to any one thing because I think the information was very in-depth and very good. Um, where do we see maybe, and I, it's good to see the grant money coming in. Um, where do we see any changes in terms of industry and even public agencies investing more in the CTE in a current pandemic or in a, you know, versus pre-pandemic um, funding and opportunities? I feel like there's a lot of turnover in industries. Unfortunately, a lot of people, it's simply almost impossible, virtually impossible to continue working in certain industries and, and currently with, you know, with retirements and whatnot. Um, this is something that we were talking about 10, 12 years ago with you know, green jobs and just city jobs and bus drivers. And so with all these pathways, um, are you hearing any different conversations when engaging with industry and with grant funders? Yeah, so, um, and I meant to speak to it be from the student advisory committee that um, we are looking at our STEM programs, so our computer science, our manufacturing product development and our engineering pathway on how we can bring more of a environmental aspect to those programs and looking at green careers and what that looks like for the future, because it definitely is ever changing in that, in that world and we need to stay on top of it. So that's why our goal is to bring in more industry partners and to work with San Mateo County Office of Ed on how we could develop our programs to stay current. But I, don't know, I think that's a major, you know, step forward and, and an opportunity. Um, also, I just want to note too, you know, with respect to um, representation across demographics and select subgroups, right? Um, you know, with um, our students who, you know, with disabilities and students learning English and um, those, who, of course, uh, disadvantaged socioeconomically, and in respect to gender equity, I think one of the things that um, I've noticed as a teacher is that students express interest across the board and even our presentation from Student Advisory Council and all of the data that was put together, you know, from student input. Um, there are courses, like actual class courses, and of course, the instructors teaching CTE um, are, in my experience, generally really engaging. Um, they're teaching electives, which are considered majors in colleges, you know, and so the demand for majors changing and trending in different ways. Um, just seeing that with, you know, with theater and, and visual and performing arts, in terms of social media and filmmaking, we have some of those programs in our elementary schools as well and in middle schools. And so um, are you seeing any shifts in interest in terms of surveying students and, and where that's being integrated into the CTE? So I think one thing that's helped is how Jefferson moved to the four by four schedule because it's opened more time in a student's schedule to be able to um, enroll in those second year pathways. When you have that traditional six period day, and you're a student learning English or a student with disabilities, it's extremely difficult to find time in your schedule to have two years of a pathway. So I think it's important as we move forward to look at alternative um, schedules for our high schools to provide those opportunities for everyone. I have a few questions. So. So my first question, comment, I guess, is more, well, first, thank you for all the work. This is great. Um, and I'm glad to see that the program is finally growing and being expanded. And so I guess um, I'm worried about our ability to continue to do this. This is a lot of grant. Mm -hmm. um, and so how do we, how do we sustain this? Uh, is, and do we, like, what is, is there a state saying anything about future grants or? So right now the grant money is still there and we are good for um, the next two school years. So um, we have enough funding to sustain where we're at and even grow for the 22-23 school year and the 23-24 year. So it's a matter of just um, continuing to apply for the grants. Our biggest challenge with that is match dollars because most grants are two to one. So for every dollar we receive, we have to show that we're spending $2 specifically on CTE to qualify for those grants. I did hear at the conference I attended a couple of weeks ago that Strong Workforce is possibly looking at making the grant a one-to-one -one match, which would help greatly. And since we don't have the kind of money that San Mateo and Sequoia are putting out for their CTE program. So, um, hopefully that'll happen and we'll be able to continue to apply for grants and receive the funding. And then my other question is more of around like the individual teachers that teach CTE. So CTE is one of those things where the financially it's, it's a bigger burden on the teacher. Yes. 
Um, and I know like a lot, some of the programs that were highlighted here as enrichment, like we don't particularly fund, like they have to be fundraised to do. And if that teacher or staff person left, then that program would leave. So I'm wondering, you know, this is an ongoing question, <laughs> but what can we do about the, you know, legacy of certain programs? Mm -hmm. How do we pass those on? Um, and then I, I you know, I, I want to expand CTE, but as a teacher, I can understand why you wouldn't want to do it, <laughs> you know, because it requires a huge lift. Yes, extra it does. Work and extra either figuring out how to pay for it, yes. through fundraising or paying for it for yourself. So there are quite a few more um, requirements when you're a CTE teacher um, of enrichment opportunities after school, um, competitions, programs like that. So it is about recruitment and also our teachers letting us know in advance if they are planning to leave, planning to retire, because it's about finding the right person. And we're currently doing that. We have a couple of teachers that are getting close to retirement age. And so we are actively recruiting and talking to people that may be interested that we think are a good fit for our programs and our schools. Yeah. And, and then... And, Sorry to no, no. follow up. Um, we always try and find ways through our grants that we can offer some type of stipend for our teachers and also a system okay. with um, funding for the supplies for those extra programs. And then my last question was around the special education and particularly our students who are on, on the non-diploma track, they are gonna go into a program where it's essentially like CTE. So I'm wondering, is there a way that they can be introduced earlier? Um, so job training skills or what, you know, how to work? Yeah. <laughs> um, so that it's it's a CTE track, because it should definitely look for inclusion in all the programs and have access for our students that have uh, special challenges. But also, are there things that we can create that are uniquely just for special education? That's something that we should definitely look into. Um, I'd love to sit down, have a more in-depth conversation and see exactly what we can make happen. Yeah. Um, one, one part of our um, why we partner with Jefferson Elementary School is to bring those eighth graders in and educate them about what we offer and what, um, as I said, that connection between us and our community college partners so that they can see that and um, start in the ninth grade. Um, and the earlier they start, the um, more likely they are to complete a pathway and have those opportunities for work-based learning and internships. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Just one quick question. First of all, thank you for the presentation. It's really heartening to see where, how far we've come over the past few years. Um, and, and the fact that, that so many of all these courses are A through G as well is, is fantastic. With regards to partnerships with businesses, <laughs> especially within within the classes in, in our curriculum. I mean, how much leeway, is, is it really about the teacher being able to reach out to certain businesses or to find ways to partner? Or for example, I work in an architecture firm and we'd probably be interested in, in potentially, you know, talking to, to a class, right? I mean, that, yeah. type, that type of thing. So how, how can we coordinate those sorts of things? Would it come through you Would it or, or go through the teacher directly? Either one. Um, sometimes those partnerships come through me. Um, I've begged my family, a lot of our industry partners are my family and friends that I grew up with in Daly City. <laughs> and I reached out and was like, hey, you're part of this community, you need to come on board. But yeah, um, and then also our teachers if they have a connection. And also they've come from our community college as well. Okay, so. okay great, we'll talk offline. I love that um, you're always looking ahead. I'm always <laughs> looking ahead and what a great presentation um, and that you allowed us to meet the students. Um, and thank goodness Victoria and Noemi are juniors. Yes. They can, right? because they're, so, they're obviously so excited about this that they're able to mentor those coming up. And 
I could just see that they're they're gonna they've started something really fantastic. Yeah, with, with I, I'm week. excited that they were able they're able to participate. As you said, they're juniors because um, we have noticed that our females are underrepresented in our engineering and computer science pathways. So the more that they are the face of it and um, can reach out to other female and identifying female students, the better. Fantastic. I really like that. Um, love the silver cord mm -hmm. at graduation. That's fantastic. I mean, it, it seems like a little thing, but it's not. It's a really big thing. Yeah. And I love that. Thank you for thinking of that. Or, I don't know who, who thought of that, but it's really wonderful. And um, I do have a question about the, uh, the work-based learning. Yes. So you said that, so the CTEG, um, it, it, it uh, helps fund work-based learning. How does that work it if does. we have a partner? So um, we partner with Pilot City. Mm -hmm. um, they are a company who, um, it is their sole um, mission to go out and find employers for us and create work-based learning projects that our students can then um, engage and meet the employer, do a project for them. They receive feedback. And then um, if they like that company and like the project, then our students can then apply for a summer internship with them. And then they go through that whole process of being submitting an application, being interviewed. And as Nicole happened, she received the internship. And we had um, four other students that did a summer internship with as well. One was with Kaiser last summer. So, yeah. That's how that works. Okay. Yeah. So That's it's wondering. just... Um, to be honest, I, I don't have the bandwidth to reach out to all these employers and create projects. And Pilot City is a company that does it. Derek, um, I love working with him. He has a very similar philosophy that I do about giving back to your community. He's out of San Leandro, and that's where his company started. And um, and we were able to connect. And yeah, we're working. And we just met last yesterday, actually. And our goal is to have 100 to 150 students enrolled in the work-based learning project in the next couple of weeks. Yeah. I, did, I did get to go to the Capstone Portfolio Showcase at Jeff, and um, it was overwhelming because it was, it was spread out. But yeah. you wanted to see everybody's <laughs> presentation, but you couldn't. And, and that the students were so well prepared. Um, their their resumes, their presentations, their um, they were so well prepared and very excited. Um, I do have one of my daughter's friends um, wasn't wasn't sure what she was going to do after mm -hmm. high school, but she uh, she chose a pathway and is so excited about culinary that she's oh, now yay. going to pursue <laughs> that. And um, and a part of a lot of that has to do with. You know, well, she took it during pandemic, right. and then she was able to now study with uh, Chef Scott. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, all the kids are so excited mm -hmm. about him, um, yeah. being I, in person in that fantastic new um, culinary uh, yes. <laughs> kitchen. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, I really applaud the teachers at Jefferson being the first ones to take on this project, and the students especially, because their first year in their pathway was online. Mm -hmm. So it was a big ask for them, and they definitely met it, both teachers and students. Well, thank you so thank much you. for your work. And uh, thank you very much. To hearing thank, more. You. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Item C, the A through G completion grant plan summary. Ms. Baca. I will be presenting on the A through G completion improvement grant once Jake gives me the power. <laughs> <laughs> the power. The power. I 
slide, I will be um, mainly talking about the grant information, but before that, I want to give you some A through G data points um, to kind of guide us where we are with A through G and also some of the proposed plans of actions and services. So just as a reminder, A through G requirements is a set of 15 courses that students have to take and they must get at least a grade of C or better um, in order to meet the minimum eligibility for the UC CSU system. So the A stands for the social science discipline. There's two-year requirement. Um, B is for English four-year requirement, so on and so forth. And before I begin, I want to um, remind the board that this journey actually began in the year 2017-2018 when we partnered with Education Trust West, where they did an equity audit of the district so to ensure that our students are ready for college and career and that our students achieve educational um, equity. So some of the key findings that um, they presented was that there are disparities in the A through G completion rates between different ethnic and economic groups of students. They also said that the A through G subject areas with the lowest rates of enrollment and successes were English, math, and science. And it is still true up till today. Um, they also found a math bridge um, derail some of the students from meeting the A through G requirements and limits access to the full A through G courses. And that um, some enrollment policies and practices for AP courses varies and did not actually um, ensure equity access for all of our students. They also said that um, we need to build structures and systems for building relationships between adults and students. There's also insufficient time for collaboration among teachers at most schools. Um, half of the faculty and staff report insufficient professional development to support the needs of all students. And that there are not enough academic supports for students during the school day. They also mentioned that there is a need for more discussion to understand systemic root causes of inequitable outcomes. And lastly, they mentioned that our chronic absenteeism rate is much higher than that of the county and the state. So since then, um, we have been slowly addressing some of um, their findings and putting some things into place. So in 1920, here are some of the things that we've put into place. Here's for 2021. And here's for 21-22. As you can see, we've put in many, many things in place. We've eliminated our math course to bridge. There is now a four by four schedule at Jefferson High School. There is now weekly collaboration. There's flex time periods at Terra Nova and Jefferson. So we put a lot of things in place, but as you know, change happens very, very slow. Um, as you can see in this data, this is the district-wide A through G rate trend. So in 1819, we're at 43.6, about 44%. It's similarly enough in 1920, and the interesting thing is it's still the same in 2021. Um, I want to say that, you know, this is pretty good considering that we are, we were under, we still are, under a pandemic um, in the 1920 and then 2021. So this is the A through G rate by race and ethnicity. Um, it's a three-year trend. So for 2021, there was a decrease in our students um, that are African Americans, that are Asian and Filipino, and then there is an increase in Hispanic two or more and white. As you can see, there is still um, a gap between um, our ethnic groups. And so our administrators, you know, right now is participating in a courageous conversation um, book study. And they said that we can't really address these um, racial disparities unless we can meaningfully talk about race issues. 
And so our administrators are working on having the courageous conversation to have the protocols to have the conversation um, district-wide. Here is um, our students learning English, the rate of A through G, and this is a trend also in comparison to the San Mateo um, schools and California schools. You can see our students learning English are performing about 10% lower than that of the state and the county. This is for our um, students with IEP. Um, still, our students are performing below than the state and the county as well. There is um, an upward trend, however. Um, this is the A through G rate by school. These are all of the students. This is our students learning English and then our students with IEP. Um, part of this grant, they also asked us to identify how many students received a grade of a D or an F during the spring of 2020 in the year 2021. And I just want to remind us that our grading policy at that time was ABC plus, ABC pass and no mark. And because um, essentially P is really a D, otherwise they would have gotten a C, we counted these students as part of this because the UC and CSU will not accept this um, grade anyway. So 16% um, of our students in the spring either receive a D, an F, or a pass or a no mark. And the top five courses with the highest um, D and F rates are biology, math course one, chemistry, English nine, and world history. Um, year 2021, we're in full distance learning. 41% of the students um, receive either a D or an F, and these are the top courses that you know they receive a D or an F in. And one thing that I want to highlight is that most of these courses are ninth grade courses, and so um, it's kind of you know saddening that during their first year of high school that they already would have to make up these courses. So about the grant. Um, the purpose of the grant is to improve the A through G rates of our students. The requirement is that a plan must be presented to the Board of Trustees and then adopted the following board meeting. Um, a plan <clears throat> must also be developed by April 1st of 2022. We have up until 2526 to spend the money. And that by December 31st, 2023, I have to report to CDE on how we are measuring the impact of these funds on the A through G rate. So the grant has three buckets of funding. There is the access grant, success grant, and learning loss mitigation. The access grant is for districts who have below 67% A through G rate. And the success grants are for the districts with um, over 67% of A through G rate. And then for the learning loss mitigation um, grant, it is for intent for students to retake the courses who receive a D or an F. <clears throat> so the funding is based on our unduplicated counts in the 2021 school year, and there is a formula. And so the total for Jefferson Union is 609064 But something that I would like to point out how this was calculated um, was that for the access grant, it was 200, about $283 per pupil. However, for the success grant with more than 67%, <clears throat> it was $714 um, per pupil. And when I looked at all of the LEAs, because it includes charter schools, 24% um, of the districts received over 67% A through G rate. And there's 250 of them. And most of the schools are um, charter schools. And also um, some of the districts that receive this have the, um, their graduation rate as the A through G um, graduation rate. Mm -hmm. So um, again, we have six, about 609000 to spend for 25-26.
These are just some of the examples and how the funds can be spent. So professional development, um, some advising plan for people support, expand access, and then um, AP fees. So we already do pay for our um, AP exams. And so we will not qualify. Um, we can't use these funds because we cannot um, supplant the funds. <clears throat> the plan requirements is that I um, have to identify how these funds will improve or increase the access for our unduplicated students. They also ask how many students um, were identified for the retake of these courses. Also, um, how these funds do not supplant our current plans. And then also a description on how we are using these funds to increase access for all students. <clears throat> so the proposed plan, these ideas came from the um, having discussions with our teacher leads and also some teachers and staff <clears throat> about what can we do? What can we do to increase A through G access? And so they had brought up peer tutoring program, and this could happen either during the school day. So for instance, Jefferson High School already has a peer tutoring program where <clears throat> the students sign up for it. Instead of being a TA, they actually sign up for it, and then they get community service. Um, because of their schedule, this is OK at Jefferson High School. However, in some of the school sites, this may happen after school. Also, our teachers ask for um, time um, during the summer to collaborate course alike planning to make sure that they share best practices um, to prepare for you know, the school year. They, you know, our, our math course one teachers would like to meet together, our Spanish teachers would like to meet together, and they would like to see this happen in the summer where they're not really all stressed out. Um, they also recommended workshops for our students and parents in understanding college and career readiness. Um, after school tutoring was also brought up. And then also um, the next bullet came up a lot because we do need a tier two intervention program that we can provide for our students during the day so that they can um, you know, catch up. Um, also, credit recovery sections um, was tossed around and also increased summer school offerings. But this time also include not just credit recovery courses, but CTE courses or visual and performing arts courses, courses that are fun, but A through G so that students sign up. So it's really more of like, you know, like summer learning kind of like They talked about potentially um, formally partnering up with organizations and colleges to provide mentorship for our students, learning English students with disabilities. So for instance, like the, um, the Los Hermanos and Las Hermanas program maybe can come to our um, school and district and really support our students. Um, <clears throat> providing advisor, mentor stipend. Also paraprofessional training came up a lot. Um, the paraprofessionals in the classroom have been very vital in helping our students. So this year, we not only have paraprofessionals for um, our um, special education classes, but we also have them for our English um, language development classes as well. Um, they also talk about providing field trip to colleges and universities just to expose students what, you know, what it's like, what it's college look like. Um, so they want to give um, funds for that. Um, keeping the size, the class sizes smaller in the designated ELD courses and our co-taught classes would also help for unduplicated students. There are some, like for instance, you know, at Terranova who may need transportation after school and if they need tutoring, 
Um, so find ways to provide transportation if they need to stay after school. Um, additional wellness support, some more um, instructional materials that are community responsive. And this one is, of course, would just have to be negotiated, but it was brought up that perhaps we may consider some kind of financial incentive for multilingual staff to support our students who speak a different language. And so with that, that is pretty much it. Questions? Thank you. I'm going to open it up to the board if you have any questions. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Bakta. That was <clears throat> pretty, very comprehensive, good, good information, good data. I'm still kind of shaking my head at the I know. access and success grants, the rich get richer, those who need, I mean, there's just no equity involved with it whatsoever, so don't know what they were thinking. Um, just, just, a couple, just a couple of other comments. Um, I'm grateful that, that you and the staff have really come up with a very comprehensive plan to address the use of the funds and to be able to, to, to do this. I think we're on the right track, con especially considering where we've been in the past. I mean, it, it's still unfortunate that, we're, that our, our grad rate is still about the same, but <clears throat> the fact that, that those numbers stay the same in the middle of a pandemic is pretty good, all things considered. So, so thank you to, uh, to you and to your team for, for this presentation, for your hard work, and looking forward to seeing how, how we can make this um, happen and how things will improve. Thank you. you. Have any other comments? Mr. Archipendi. Thank you for the presentation. Um, yeah, no, I think uh, I'm glad we're working obviously with Edge West and a number of different organizations to help us kind of address a lot of things in our community that I think could use an outside lens as well. Um, I know my experience working in different school districts and just um, even at the college level, one of the things that we would talk about is you know, things we wish we had in high school when we were in high school. And then the next step, of course, understanding that not all high school districts are created equally, right? So the inequities that are already in public education exist, but there's ways for us to address that, right? And so I think many of the things that we're continuing to do are good, and I think are solid approaches. Um, the last couple of slides, I think, spoke well to that in terms of, uh, in some of the first few, in terms of, you know, creating more flex time and, you know, expanding course offerings, CTE. Like, there's so many things that our district is doing um, to, I think, address that. Um, one of the things I did notice, and it was interesting to see it pointed out, um, A through G rates, and these are our rates based off of the grading, too, of whatever courses students are failing. And so my first question would be, um, just for clarity, because um, I noticed it was like math, different levels of math, but chemistry, biology, world history, um, in different schools, sometimes this varies by grade in which chemistry and biology are being offered. Do we see any trends in terms of where our students who had, who are, who are currently sophomores or juniors, or, or those who are juniors and seniors, like, were more disproportionately impacted? Um, and the reason why I ask is because I know in my experience, a lot of our students who say are freshmen really only had about six months of middle school before attending high school. So that data will be new in terms of where they are, you know, in their grades last semester. But our sophomores, juniors, and seniors, um, there are state laws like AB 104 addressing, you know, those who have failed courses and making sure they graduate on time, um, which is another question of mine. But did you see any trends in terms of, like, whether it's sophomores and juniors or juniors and seniors in terms of courses they're not completing? Um, when, when you Ed Trust West did their on-track, off-track. Um, again, it's the first year um, where students really kind of, you know, just fall off. And yeah. so it's really, really important. I feel that, we you know, we work really closely with our ninth grade um, teachers and ninth grade team to really support our students so they do not fall off track. Um, we ha I haven't done um, a serious analysis on like, you know, whether sophomore to junior or junior to sophomore, but that's something that we can look into. But as far as we know right now, you know, it's when they start freshman year. And what happens is that some students do lose hope and they, you know, just say, well, I'm going to a community college anyway. I don't need to meet, you know, the A through G requirement, but what, you know, what they don't understand is that taking these courses is not just about, you know, 
getting into a four-year college, just having the experience that the and the rigor of these what these classes provide. Um, so that is, you know, one thing that we really need to instill because there's still this mindset that, oh, I'm just going to go to four-year college, therefore I don't need to take this, you know, world language class. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that, um, and I've heard that too from many students, right? Um, they're already kind of gauging their trajectory like, well, you know what, last year didn't matter so much or if that was their freshman year that it had less impact, so they're not thinking about it as hard. Um, I guess the second part, too, is the response to, you know, grading and seeing how many grades, you know, Ds, Fs, NMs. Um, I think one of the things um, I've noticed is that social-emotional learning, and we talk about empathy during the pandemic and how much we need to understand, you know, where our community is, where our students are, and the impact it's having on their mental health, and, of course, returning to school, that as well, after a full year and a half of, of being out, essentially. Um, I think it's good we're, we're providing, you know, of course, more wellness and more mental health there. Um, I think it's good for EdTrust West to point out that, you know, in terms of hard data, the grading maybe isn't necessarily reflecting that the grading is reflecting uh, maybe the efforts of students and teachers and, and staff in terms of meeting those grades. Um, I guess my question would be, where have um, wellness staff, have, have, they had an input, have they had an opportunity to have input on grading uh, to a significant degree? Um, and if so, at like what point of the semester were they maybe, you know, able to, if, and you can't share information across some of these channels, obviously, but does wellness have, have uh, some kind of input in terms of that process when it comes down to grades every semester or marking period? I know that, you know, under um, the leadership of Melissa Ambrose, we've been talking with the wellness counselors and they do talk during their staff meetings okay. to ensure that, you know, that our students are taking care of first emotionally and you know before you know and speaking with our teachers too so that because we really need to be more graceful and forgiving um that's why SAT meetings. and there's also yes student assistance team meetings and supporting the needs of our students so we do recognize that you know it's really important you know to be like what miss casey first to be human first um, and so our wellness counselors have been instrumental in that. Um, but also, you know, we want to couple it with, it's not just all about social emotional, but we also still do, you know, have to do our work and, you know, academics also. So it's that balance. But I do, our wellness counselors have been excellent in supporting our teachers and students in the wellness area. Right on. Um... That's good to hear, um, and I believe it's happening. I just want to know to what extent. And, um, so that's good. Uh, I guess my just last follow-up question on that is, um, with AB 104, the state law that allows for a lot of our juniors and seniors who are disproportionately impacted during the pandemic to be able to apply for credit recovery, essentially, and making sure that they can still graduate on time and be eligible for extracurricular activities and whatnot, um, did we cover any data in terms of how many people applied or how much outreach was done to make sure because the deadlines were, were they were like extended in the late summer and early fall so it was a very small window i wasn't sure how much outreach was done but um did that have much of an impact or have you seen much data on that regarding changing the grades to a pass or um or pass um there are very many um students that opted into it because of our grading policy that we have adopted as far as um, the waiver for graduation requirements, um, our counselors are meeting with the students and reviewing transcripts and see who would qualify for um, to meet the graduation requirement. So they met with them earlier in the year? So there are stages that we look at where counselors do transcript evaluation yeah. to see if, um, you know, of course we want them to meet the 225 requirements first. Yeah. Um, but for, you know, for whatever reason, circumstances happen, they do have a process in meeting with the student and the families and have a discussion on whether um, AB 104 would be the better route. Right on. Um, yeah, I guess I'm just wondering, too, if the state's looking at revisiting that for next year in terms of where our juniors are at in their eighth UG, because certainly some will still have fallen behind this year, um, and if that's an option, but thank you. I have a few questions. Okay. So... Um, it, so first, thanks for pulling together all this data. You know, I love it. And then, um, 
secondly, to me, the, the, for the thing that jumps out at me the most is how far behind we are, the, the county and the state. And so I am really glad that we are talking about looking at this at, um, at an equi with an equitable lens, with an equity lens, because when you also look at the breakdown between where our schools are located in a city, you know, the Daly City Schools with the Pacifica Schools, they, you know, the difference is, is glaring. And so um, I'm wondering, is it possible to look at, like, housing stability? I mean, there's a lot of things that go into this. I'm, I don't know, you know, the Healthy Kids Survey. Like, can we compare some of, those, some of the data from those things to see, you know, are there, what, what outside forces are coming into play with the ability to be fully present in school? Um, and then the second thing I wanted to talk about is staff belief in every student being able to reach A to G. So, I mean, if you talk to staff, you get a wide variety where some staff are really gung-ho about, yes, we need to get everyone A to G, and then you get other staff who are more ambivalent to it, and, you know, it's not for everyone. And so, I, you know, we had the discussion about students don't understand, but I think also having the discussion with staff with an equity lens of why it's important. You know, it's a, a white male with a high school diploma makes as much as a black or brown person with a college degree. If you don't have graduate from high school as a person of color with the ability to go to four-year uh, college, you will mil it'll cut millions of dollars off your salary for the rest of your life. Um, the other thing is that when we're talking about the prison pipeline, it's the, if you look at who doesn't go to prison and who does, if you have a college degree and if you're a person of color, it almost eliminates you from going to jail. So there's, there's bigger things at play here when it comes to the A to G rate than just us wanting to hit that data point, you know, and I don't know if people understand that. Um, so having those courageous conversations and really doing that deep dive into when we don't hit these numbers, what are the outcomes for a vast majority of our students, I think is a conversation that I'm really wanting to have and be a part of. Um, and then while I'm you know, glad we have the grants and I know like the way the grants are, the state does the grants, whatever, grant money is not gonna get us out of this. So really like having the discussion about our entire budget, you know, we're starting a conversation with a grant, but that's not gonna help alleviate the problem. It's gonna help us a little bit or help with support, but the real discussion is in LCAP, and you know I'll wait for then that period to have a broader discussion about all of this. So thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I do like hearing you say vibe. Uh, so whatever can get the students there. Um, but thank you again for all your hard work on this and, and for keeping us informed. So now we're moving on to the district masking requirements. Thank you. Okay, so um, as I think everybody knows, um, the state lifted the masking requirement um, for K-12 settings. I think it was at midnight, 11.59 on March 11th. So um, we, I met with, I've met with lots and lots of groups in these last couple of weeks about this. Um, met with executive cabinet, met with um, union leadership, met with superintendents throughout the county and our county superintendent, um, hearing uh, opinions and facts um, in trying to formulate my uh, recommendation to you. So um, as I said, the, the requirement for masks is lifted. However, the CDPH is really giving a strong recommendation um, to wear masks indoors. So they're really saying masks still should be worn, but it's just not mandated. Um, a bit of background, there, um, there will be no distinction between vaccinated and un unvaccinated individuals from the CDPH. 
Um, some background in the county, the positivity rate in San Mateo County is 1.72%. Hospitalizations in San Mateo County are 28. Um, the metrics for COVID have shifted from cases to hospitalizations as we enter this new phase of the pandemic. And the restrictions are lessening all around. Um, I am recommending um, to, to the board um, that we remain aligned with the state and county guidelines and that we move to strongly recommending masking indoors beginning tomorrow. Um, I've put, placed this on as a discussion item. I'm asking for your guidance. Mm -hmm. um, and here's just some of the rationale. Um, the district has followed CDPH and county recommendations throughout the pandemic. Um, and uh, we feel we should continue to do so as they're based on data. The district conferred with the district and myself conferred with staff. Um, and while some prefer that the mask mandate remain, many are ready for the requirement to be lifted as long as we continue with other safety measures. Uh, many, most of our neighboring districts are aligning with the new state and county guidance. Um, some districts have decided to keep masking um, requirements for a period of time, some a couple of weeks, some have decided after spring break. Um, locally, our partner districts, um, initially all were saying that they were going to follow the guidelines and be unmasked as of yesterday, but some have changed. Um, Pacifica Elementary is going to remain masked until March 28th. Bayshore is going to be ma remain masked for a matter of weeks. I'm not sure on their date actually. Jefferson Elementary um, is, as of yesterday, um, moving with the CDPH guidance, and so it's strongly recommended in Jefferson Elementary as well as Brisbane. So that's just a point of reference for you know our our feeder school districts, so that the siblings of our of our students. Um, I'm sure you follow the news. San Francisco started off saying they were going to follow, or sorry, that they were going to keep masking requirements, but then they, they changed that, and high school and middle schools are just strongly recommended. Um, and then throughout the county, some high school districts are going unmasked. Um, sorry, with the strongly recommended as of yesterday, um, San Mateo Union uh, decided last week to remain masked um, and they were going to discuss it again at a later board meeting. So it's kind of, a, you know, different, different choices for different, different school districts. Um, so I really, I kind of listened to that and then listened to our local people here and made, and made my recommendation. Um, let's see, many staff, one of, one of the decision points um, is that many of our staff are fatigued and enforcing mask wearing will be really difficult. Um, especially when state and local health departments aren't requiring it. So our students and our staff members have been really, um, they have followed what we've said. It, it, ha it has been, um, we, we also have made a choice not to have really punitive measures for students, you know, about the masking requirements, um, but, but they have really followed along and it, it's the worry of, um, of many in our district that it will be very hard to enforce it when they don't have to wear masks most other places. Um, I want to reiterate, we're going to continue to have the CAN-95 masks available for anybody who wants them. We are continuing to monitor air circulation in our buildings. In fact, we've had our staff in all of the classrooms monitoring just these last couple of weeks. Um, there are, I think, three or four classrooms or four rooms in, Ms. Renner, is it at Westmore and Terranova? Okay. So there were a few classrooms, I think four classrooms, that the rate, the numbers were a little bit higher. Mm -hmm. So we have our air our HVAC person on site working on that. And if he needs to go to professionals outside of the district, we will um, improve on that. Um, we are going to watch our case numbers. And if they increase, we will reassess. They are, are significantly lower. In fact, I'm gonna look over at our COVID director. Then this morning you were informing me of the numbers and it was a exponential dip. Do you have that on hand? I'm sorry, I'm calling on you. Can you share that with me, please? Sure. Um, we had, in January, we had over 500 um, staff and student COVID positive cases reported to us. In the first two weeks of February, before the um, February break, we had a little over 100. And since February break, we now have had 12. So it's really gone, which, which tracks with everything that's going on um, across the country. Thank you so much. 
Um, so we will continue. We have purchased uh, thousands of at-home tests. Uh, we also received thousands from the County Office of Education just this last week. Um, we will send home those tests with staff and students before spring break again and give um, information about testing before you come back and then a few days after. And then we've got, you know, really ample amounts for anybody who needs them. Um, and finally, we will continue to stress that masking in school buildings is strongly recommended. It doesn't mean everybody take off your masks. Everything is great now, you know. Um, but for all of these reasons, I am recommending that we do follow the CDPH guidance beginning tomorrow. I want to also let you know, this is really a combination of a lot of conversations with people. And we contemplated, should we, you know, give it another week? Should we give it the rest of this week? And, you know, after many conversations, we really decided that there's a lot of people kind of listening, watching, and finding out, want to know what's happening tonight. And, and so... Um, if you do agree with my recommendation, I think that we would message it out um, so that tomorrow it, it is strongly recommended. So with that, I, it's my recommendation. Okay. Do we have any discussion, any questions? I'm ready to, I, I we've always followed the guidance and um, I personally will keep my mask on because it'll be, I'm at risk, I'm at higher risk um, person. Um, and I know that my daughter and her friends are going to keep their masks on, but at least that's that's their prerogative, mm -hmm. right? So, mm -hmm. um, so I'm ready to. Uh, I, I accept the recommendation. I wonder how others feel about that. Okay. I'm a little torn, to be honest. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I'm gen generally it's about following the guidance, but I'm sort of you know watching some of the stuff that's happening in other countries and especially the new BA two. Mm -hmm variant that I'm concerned about and that may be popping up. Well, I mean, we know it's here. It's just a matter of, of what kind of spike it may cause, which that's the only thing that's given me any, any sort of pause. But in general, I sort of lean towards the guidance at the moment. But I, I, would, I would think that we would, if we do so, I, mm -hmm. we need to really be quick on the, on the trigger to just simply throw those masks, Absolutely. to make the masks a mandate again if we really do start to see an, um, an uptick of some kind. May I, um, on that note, what I wonder is, I, I agree with you that we would need to be fast, and I would ask that um, the board maybe just allow the administration to make that decision, and maybe not wait till the next board meeting if there's if there's a real big spike. I, I, that may be something I, 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 that... I would, I would agree with that personally. Well, we're doing that now already, right? Yeah, we're not exactly. voting. It's a discussion right. item. Yeah, discussion correct. Item. But I have given, I have not made the moves without your direction. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, I was wondering too, um, in terms of no pressure, student trustees, any student input or what the post is amongst discussion at school in terms of the masks and um, where, yeah, people are feel. Yeah, actually, I did speak to a couple students that watched a lot about how they felt about mm -hmm. mask mandate. Mm -hmm. Some people felt that they were going to have to wear a mask to go to school. Some people said maybe we should watch like the other schools and Use them as guinea pigs to see like, how that works out before we decide to uh, remove mask mandate. And I've also heard other students saying um, it doesn't really matter to them whether or not it's lifted because they personally will be keeping their mask on regardless. That kind of tracks with what I was hearing at student advisory as well. I think that there are a lot of students who are not comfortable taking off their masks and, and will keep their masks on. Um, and then there was also sentiment from some students that um, there are many kids who are already maskless around each other frequently and that, you know, they wouldn't, there wouldn't be much different. So I really do think on this topic, there are, there are opinions on both sides, you know, um, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, clearly. Um... Thank you for that. Um, I think it's very important to understand the majority of people in our district are our students. And so they are, of course, the first and I think foremost people affected, you know, by this. And of course, the families, including our partner districts. Um, it's good to, to know that I think people are, have been keeping up with the news and I mean, just things you get alerts on. Everybody has an idea of where we are in the pandemic to a degree. And they have parents and family members certainly who've been affected. 
been impacted, um, you know, across the range um, throughout this pandemic so far. So I think a healthy, you know, encouragement of, you know, strongly recommending it is one thing I also think, and which I would, of course, agree with. I, I personally and professionally, um, I encourage my students, you know, and our students to, to, and our families and communities to take, you know, an abundance of caution as we have throughout the pandemic. And I actually would align towards, like, this is not an action item. I know this is encouragement. Um, spring break is just around the corner. Um, given that people will be traveling and whatnot, I think, one, having the test is really important because I know even testing rates may be a little less right now, given who are with vaccinations and whatnot. So people may test before and after even traveling. And so that, as a consideration here in the international community that we live in, um, especially in, in where we are as a hot spot in our county, which is not reflective of most of the county, and and looking at what other counties around the Bay Area are doing, um, I think reflects where people's you know, concerns are. And I think most people will probably keep masks on. I'm, I'm on transit. Mm -hmm. Everybody's masked. Um, if somebody is not masked, I mean, it's been enforced by bus drivers, or by bar operators, you name it. Um, it's something that's going to be at the front of our minds. So I would be an advocate of not you know, being in a rush to drop the mask mandate this week or next week. I would kind of wait for spring break on our next meeting to take a continued pulse of that. I think clearly public health agencies have taken account of this and our COVID director as well. And so um, for me, I think if we have a little bit more time, we'll be able to see more data. Um, and I think give people a chance to, to not be stressed out before spring break, to know that, yeah, you know, even if I'm masking up but my peers aren't, then I'm still less, we're all still less at risk. Um, I think that would be understandable too. So I would be in favor of, of giving it, like waiting until our next meeting to make a decision. So. But that would be my, my stance on that. We did consider um, a week after spring break, which would be April 18th, another month of masking. Um, and that's, you know, it's, it's certainly an option to do that. Um, the, you know, as I said, the, for these different reasons, not the least of which is really um, just the uh, enforcement of it for, the, for another month um, felt quite difficult to our administrators. So, I'm of a couple minds on this. I understand both sides. I will say that COVID and education has been completely hijacked, the response by people of privilege. And I say that because if you are one family or if you are another family, and like I consider myself a person of privilege, so if I get COVID, I get a week off of work or two weeks off of work. It's not a big deal. I'm boosted. I can take that time off of work. If another family where you're working two jobs or three jobs and you get COVID and you're boosted and you have to take that time off of work, you may get fired. So um, it's not a life or death thing where you may not die, but you might if you lose your housing or if you lose your job and you can't feed your family. And a lot of the support services in the county have gone away. Um, so it's hard for me to then make a decision in my seat of if, you know, at my job, we don't have the mask mandate. And I know, like, I've seen other people get it, and they seemed fine, and they were able to take the time off of work. And I think about the families and a lot of the families who I met who somebody got COVID and it was devastating, right? Or you, if you're living in multifamily housing, and we know a lot of our families, there's two families to an apartment, person gets COVID, they have to leave because they don't want everybody else to get COVID. So that is my one train of thinking. The other part of me has been, I've been on campuses and I see what the mask that a lot of the students are wearing, they might as well not be wearing masks, right? So many of our teachers and students and staff have been sitting in classrooms where real, realistically 60% of the students are properly masked and the others are not. So we've already been doing it kind of because I feel like if we lift the mandate, I think there's probably gonna be about 60% of the students would keep their mask on and the rest of them would take their masks off. So, to protect the students that are that are of higher risk and are in high risk communities, and we're just talking about like how outside things may affect your schooling, you know, can we ensure that every student has access to the proper mask? That we have counseling and people in place 
to make sure that there's not peer pressure to not wear your mask. Because I know, I, I mean, there have been times when I walk into a, I, I still wear my mask sometimes at work. There have been times I walk to a conference room and I'm the only one wearing a mask and I feel a way. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, so can, can we make sure that there is protections for those students in, in all situations to feel like if you want to wear a mask or if you don't want to wear a mask, it's, yeah, it's, you know, and how are we educating people on how to look for that and making sure that that's okay? Yeah. And, um, and again, um, making sure, as you talked about, that we track the numbers and of are we are tracking, continue to track COVID positive cases and follow those trends that everybody goes home with the test. And if possible, can we start getting numbers on the number of students who are vaccinated? Um, because that is another good piece of information for me to know is like, you know, one of the things that make me safe at work is that I know that 100% of, mm-hmm. the, of employees are vaccinated. So if we have a high, I know, and I can, I know our vaccination rate is high because Daily City at a whole is high, even in some of our populations that are, have lower uh, resource, but it would be, it would be nice to just get that number and then start working on making sure that we get folks vaccinated who still want to and just haven't had the ability to do so. Yes, we can totally do that. We, um, we did get, we did ask for the data on student vaccinations initially, and I think it was over 60%, as I recall. Um, and, but we didn't have a high response rate. Mm-hmm. So we kind of focused on more important things at the time, but we can certainly make another push to get that yeah, data. We know that the, the staff vaccination rate is really, really high. Mm-hmm. 90, 93%. 93%. But again, you know, uh, but yeah, we can. I I always support district recommendations. I know you guys have put a lot of work in that. Thank you for asking us for our feedback. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now for uh, equity st- study session. Um, sure. Uh, yes. I think I put you down as speaker. No, you're, you're down I? as speaker. Okay. Well, we were at our board <laughs> at our board study session on Saturday. There was a request. Um, we discussed uh, having a Saturday session on equity, and then um, when we met for agenda planning, um, we decided that we should probably put it out to the full board at an open session. I know that Trustee Achapinti wasn't in on that discussion, and talk about whether we want to hold it on that Saturday. Whether we want to. There was discussion about perhaps holding it on a weeknight. Um, and so we're bringing it to open session to just talk about scheduling that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just want to note first. Um, sure. We do have a race and equity task force, I guess, that was, uh, that was initially put together. Um, I joined that sometime last year. We have not had an opportunity to meet. Um, Correct. That would be probably something I would recommend doing first before holding a study session. Um, is it possible to schedule that? For some time, you know, uh, and that would be, if I'm not mistaken, um, two of our principals who are on the task force. Is there anybody else who's been yeah. who's doing that since? Or We can certainly do that. Um, there was a, the discussion that we had was talking about working on the equity policy, which is, the, you know, for the board to work on the equity policy. Mm-hmm. I think we can do both. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I think obviously equity encompasses alike all of our customers in the yeah. school board yeah. and the school district. Uh, that said, I think in terms of race and equity and examining that and seeing our progress with ethnic studies and a lot of things and also seeing what Ed Trust West is seeing just in the data and, and what we're doing and maybe some of the things they're not seeing but things that we're working on, those are discussions I would like to hear from site leaders and from students, obviously, who have a lot of great input and preparing for a study session that would be, um, one, I would also re- request that it's recorded and it's public accessible through Zoom or however people can attend. Because if we're having a study session about equity, it probably should include our public and community given that it's already March and our school year will be ending in less than 10 weeks. So if that's possible, I think we should have a meeting as a task force and then plan for this. If that sounds... I would like to just go ahead and move forward with whatever date that the board decides is good if the, uh, the date that we picked somehow doesn't work. I think because um, we, we haven't really done much on our equity policy. Yeah. So this is a good way to, for us to get together with our like minds um, as a board 
And I think that was the impetus for this. Because we haven't, we, because of COVID, we have been spending less time on, on um, our equity um, work. So, and I know that you were asking about the task force, but I think that can be separate from what we do as a board. And maybe in a way that'll help us uh, plan more. And then when you work with the task force, you know, that'll solidify what the district is doing. But we as a board, we should just get going on it um, before the school year's out. I would say that we have an equity statement for our district. We've done this as a board a few times, and it's been at least a year since we started that process. I guess my question, my first one would be what we're missing in terms of our board discussion around equity. And, and my second would be prioritizing actually the input of our school district community, our students, our faculty, our staff, and our community at large, who um, for the last um, meeting was a community meeting. It was on Zoom in February of last year, if I'm not mistaken. And it was, um, actually it was, yeah, in 2020, I want to say. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a large turnout. And so I feel like that would provide a platform that we haven't returned to since before we've had ongoing board discussions. Um, and I don't think, I don't see them as separate actually. I understand your recommendation, um, President Sahara, but I don't know that what we're doing as a race and equity task force in the district would be different at all from an equity study session as a school board. If I may, I think, I think the, the main thing really is, is we know there's, the CSBA has put out a draft equity policy that we can use as a starting point. I know other school districts have used that and modified it to suit their purposes. Um, and I think it's important for us as a governance team to actually come up and make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of that policy, which then could help inform the work of the race and equity task force, because it really, because it really becomes the board setting, setting a direction and then the equity, race and equity task force running with it. I think that's how we should approach it because that's how we, with, with any other initiative, that's what we typically do. The board sets the dire direction with the superintendent and the superintendent executes the plan. So I, I know that we were looking at some, uh, like a Saturday date mm -hmm. in May. Mm -hmm. um, I still think I'm okay with a, with a Saturday date like May 7th or May 14th, something, something like that. So the reason we brought it back is I think that we had set May 7th as the date and then I received some input that that date wasn't good for some other people. So if anybody has another date to propose or if you want to go ahead and move with that May 7th date. I would suggest we just have a discussion at a board meeting, at a regular board meeting. Um, that way we would have ample, or at least an opportunity. Um, perhaps we can have public comment through virtual means online, again, so that we can have that input. I think as a board, we discuss things all the time. We've actually discussed equity. We have an equity statement already. So if there's a CSBA recommendation, um, we can look at the language from that. And I think if we want to talk about that in a regular meeting, it's fine. I honestly don't think that we need a Saturday morning session to talk about something we've been talking about at Saturday morning sessions for over a year and a half now. Um, equity will always be at the center of our work, but I don't know what this would be separate from the community. I, I actually at, want community at, input. It's in, looking at policy. We want to, I want to yeah. look at some policy. So that's what's different than from this meeting from previous meetings. We've not yet looked at our policies mm -hmm. and change, um, change policies to be more in line with our equity statement. So if you're not you're not available on a Saturday, we can do it in the evening. I can do it at a regular board meeting. Yeah. I would like to just keep it as a work study yeah, because work I'm looking study. at this board meeting and it yeah. is very long. So yeah. uh, I would like to have a work study so that we can focus just focus on, on that, that as it's an important topic. I would mm -hmm. agree. And, and the work studies are open, so mm -hmm. people can attend them. Can they attend virtually online? We're not virtual. And why is that? We're talking about the equity study session, yeah. so I would think like we would need to like, are we going to have the study session? Can we just pick a date? Yeah, let's pick a date. So there was a proposal for May seventh, nine to twelve, and I that initially I think that date worked, but then I think it doesn't work for everybody. Is there? Do we want to go back to that date? Do we want to propose? And uh, what one of the proposals that I had was for maybe another meet, another evening meeting. Um, like six to nine, six to nine on a weeknight or nine to 12 on that Saturday or another Saturday. Mm 
I'll make whatever date work works. I was fine with the original date. I'll be okay yeah. with whatever. If date. I'm fine with May seventh, I mean I'm also okay if we want to move it back to April thirtieth. We'd be here for two consecutive Saturdays, though. We'd have April twenty third, which was the LCAP and, and budget, and then you'd have the thirtieth for equity. But I'm I'm okay. Thirtieth. Uh, so we're we have so we're twenty. We've got one for the twenty third already. Right. I. I I don't think I'm available on the 30th. I can't the 30th. Well, then let's keep it up. May, then let's do May 7th. I'm fine with an evening as well, but I think the one thing about a Saturday is that. Is it, there an evening that works for the people that weren't as available on the 7th? The 7th is fine with me. Um, I, I can do the 7th. Okay. okay. So we'll keep it on May 7th from 9 to 12. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay, so now we are going on to the board meeting COVID procedures. Okay. Thank you. So um, I have here again at our study session, the last most recent study session, um, we discussed this and I brought it here so we can have a discussion in um, regular board meeting about changing some of our uh, meeting board meeting procedures that we had changed because of COVID. I've asked um, Gina Beltramo, our county counsel, to be here so she could speak to number three. Um, but here they are. I'm just going to read them to you and we can have a discussion. So first off, as COVID cases have decreased and restrictions lifted, um, I'm recommending that we allow members of the public to attend board meetings without providing proof of COVID vaccination or negative COVID test. My first recommendation. Second, because student trustees are not elected officials, and their votes are advisory and not counted towards a quorum, um, I'm recommending that student trustees be allowed to access meetings remotely if necessary due to spikes in COVID. And then third, um, administration of the public comment portion of the meeting was changed so that public comment would be avail um, is available only in person. That started as of tonight's meeting. Um, as such, an email address was required in order to make public comment from a remote location. There was concern that this was not in strict adherence to the Brown Act. So for that and other administrative reasons, County Council has recommended that the best way forward is to go back to in-person public comment only, just as we did before the pandemic. Um, actually, I think my first line is not correct. We changed the public comment so that public comment would be made available remotely as well. And um, we are now switching it back upon advice of county council. We also actually did talk about this at our study session, um, but we were going to discuss it publicly before making that change. We made that change without discussing it publicly because we found that we weren't in strict compliance with the Brown Act. So if you would, um, Gina, would you like to come and help us navigate number three? Um, why don't we start with number th three so that Gina can go home <laughs> afterwards if she'd like. So if there are any questions about why we've done this tonight or um, why it is recommended, um, please ask. Gina, do you want to give a little, did I explain it well enough or do you have anything to add? Well, you explained it very well. I mean, as you know, um, you know, just to give it context, yeah. pre-COVID, everything was in person. Um, COVID hit, we all went online, everything was online. And then when the district decided to go back in person, our office actually counseled <laughs> many districts to bring everything back in person only, including public comment. Um, but the district wanted to try to enhance the community involvement as much as possible. So public comment was still allowed to be made virtually. Um, and in order to do public comment, I think the, the blue card, the online blue card required phone, email, name, I think at first, and, and there was a complaint lodged with the DA's office that this was not compliant with the Brown Act. So in working with staff, we dialed it back a bit, and then it was only email and phone. Email because it was a Zoom platform. We needed the email address to allow the public comment. Phone because in case the Zoom wasn't working, we wanted a way to get in contact with that community member to let them know the Zoom wasn't working. There was another complaint about a Brown Act violation. Again, the DA's office was involved. That meant my office was involved. 
staff time was involved. There was a lot of back and forth, and there was, and we dialed it back again to only email. <laughs> only email was required. But there are still Brown Act complaints. Email is, it shouldn't be required. It's a Brown Act violation. A lot of district time, staff time was spent, my office time was spent. Um, and, you know, there is, there is um, it's not a clear Brown Act violation. It is, you know, in order, the Brown Act prohibits conditioning public participation, public attendance at a public meeting um, upon uh, supplying identifying information. That's prohibited by the Brown Act. The Brown Act allows reasonable requirements for public comment. So an argument can be made that an email address is a reasonable requirement. The government code hasn't quite caught up with technology, and so the district was living in a gray area um, where an argument could be made either way. And because the district was living in a gray area, and because there was a um, very active um, a very active uh, faction of the community that continued to complain about this Brown Act requirements, which was then taking staff time, county council time. Um, I, my office, I recommended that we, the district, no longer continue to live in the gray area and go back to clear and um, certain compliance with the Brown Act, which meant public comment by in person only. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Roger Pinty, you had his hand up. Sure. Thank you for that information. Um, so I have addressed this at a couple of board meetings, um, at least a few. And um, it, actually in our county, um, our county board of supervisors continues to meet virtually. So that is, has been used as a standard in our county, not that people are meeting in person. Just want to, for clarity, um, put that out there. But Secondly, our city of Daly City, um, the city of San Francisco, many major cities across California are still meeting virtually. And if people want to attend, there is a vaccination requirement. Otherwise, um, it is closed to the public because of the capacity and just otherwise, there, are, there is, in essence, always open access. And there are mitigation measures. While government, you can say that there's a reasonable argument to say that um, asking for an email is, you know, is reasonable, it's still a violation of the Brown Act. Um, reading the text of the Brown Act, that is explicitly clear that nobody should be required in the update to the Brown Act per our virtual meetings outlines that, which I'm sure you're aware of. Um, the second part is, as people have increased their engagement, the question must be made what public comment is for. In our institutions, in governance, public comment is here as a centerpiece to public meetings because our meetings are not held for private agencies. They're not held for the agency itself of governance. It's held for the public to see what the public agency is doing in front of the public and with the public. And so if the public is inhibited in engaging in the democratic process in any way, we need to make sure the safeguards are there to expand and encourage civic engagement and not to discourage it. Um, that said, I, I do see that um, if there were apparently complaints about Brian violations, that there has to be a response from our county, a legal response. Um, and that legal response to me should take into account encouraging civic engagement. And so um, I guess my first, well, first question would be, um, why was the response to restrict civic engagement to only in-person meetings, given that our community, and per even the comments of other board members, not just myself, has actually gotten more engaged in our community, not just at the school district level, but at the city, county, even state levels, and federal, through virtual means? Why would we now rescind that and, and go to a more restrictive measure when that's moving away from civic engagement? Well, that wasn't my initial response. As I just mentioned, there was a long history of trying to meet the complaints of the community while still adhering to the Brown Act and still allowing public comment. We went back, we tried a lot of different things and there were still members of the community who weren't happy. And like I said, we landed in a gray area of the law. You are right, there are other public meetings that are held virtually, but this district has decided to go in person because to do otherwise, you would need to make findings, the AB 361 findings, that there is an imminent risk of harm to have in-person meetings. And this district decided that that was not the best way to go because everybody's in school and learning in person. 
And so it made sense to have in-person meetings. So those other board meetings that you mentioned, those other city council meetings that you mentioned, are making those findings and are holding them virtually because of that. This district has gone a different way, and that's why the public comment is going back to the pre-pandemic ways as well. So thank you for that information. I, I can tell you that other school districts are still meeting virtually as well, not just city councils and um, other agencies. And those are districts which I believe set a high bar for democracy and for civic engagement. If we are going to adhere to a low bar and a low fidelity approach to engage in our public, I think not only sends the wrong message, um, it sets the wrong example. And because we are able and able with respect to health and public health guidelines to hold engagement through virtual means, and there was even a, a policy around civility that was discussed here, there is no reason why we cannot have hybrid engagement at our meetings. In fact, I would question why there is no longer that option, because I do believe that gray area can be achieved through call-in, through providing a Zoom option where you're not requiring um, people with personal email, but if they are, uh, they can call in through the Zoom line as well. So you can do it through strictly calls, you can do it through Zoom through calls, and if people are willing to engage through Zoom, you can provide them the option if they choose to engage. But we should not be requesting their personal information. And there are ways to do that. Other agencies are doing it, and I will ask that our county explore those options before this option, because this option actually takes us two steps backwards from into pre-pandemic conditions, which even when the pandemic is over, at some point, hopefully in the foreseeable future, or at least at a different stage, we can still continue virtual engagement because many of our community, this is the only way, including people with persons with disabilities, to be able to engage in our meetings. That is a step forward. It's actually something that we've improved. And the world government, I would agree, has room for improvement, that we should look towards those governments and those government, those public agencies who have made the improvements and use that as an example instead of simply abandoning our virtual engagement, because I believe that's the wrong approach. So a quick question for you, Ms. Baltramo. We, we have, is there a requirement for us to have virtual public comment for the Brown Act? No. Okay. Um, and because we have not chosen to do an AB 361 resolution, therefore, and, and, and to meet virtually, therefore, we do not need to provide a virtual public comment. Correct. And your recommendation is for us to continue on with an in-person public comment, consistent with us being in-person, because as you've stated, and as we've stated as a board for the past year, that it's important for us to be in-person when teachers and students and staff are back in-person. So to the extent that other agencies are, do, are choosing to do an AB 361 resolution, that's fine for them. We've chosen not to, and I fully support this in-person public comment, given this. Now, if the Brown Act were to be amended by the legislature this year, then that's a different story altogether. But until that happens, I'm happy to do this. Agreed. Okay. My next question would be um, both the County Council, apparently, um, for a comment earlier by another trustee, that this was at your direction that we dropped this policy and that it wasn't the decision of board members. Um, being that it was implemented tonight before any decisions have been made, I will ask superintendent and any board member who was privy to this prior to this meeting why this policy was implemented prior to any action being taken on an action item on our agenda. <clears throat> I can speak to that and then um, Ms. Beltramo can as well. It's not an action item, it's a discussion item. Um, but I, um, we were going to bring it as a discussion item tonight in advance of um, county council advising us to stop right away because we were in that gray area. We were still going back and forth about with, with the complaints, with the multiple complaints to the DA. So um, we had discussed putting it on and having a discussion about it. Um, I grappled with just following the advice of county council and not putting it on this agenda and decided that it was best to put it on the agenda so we could have an open discussion about it. But we uh, um, made the decision to follow the advice of our legal counsel. Thank you for clarifying that. I didn't direct the district no. to do anything. No. It was. It, legal advice, advice. Mm -hmm. um, and it was discussed. It, there was no direction by legal counsel. My follow-up question for that is this. Is, um, 
Given that this was never in a past um, agenda item, never suggested as a future agenda item by any board member, um, why this would arrive in terms of our meeting being conducted, this question I would like an answer to. Why was this implemented tonight before our discussion of this item was held? So we discussed it at the um, board study session, the recent board study session, where we were talking about meeting protocols, et cetera. The board discussed it at that meeting and um, wanted to bring it to an open session for the larger discussion where you were all present because you were not all present at that meeting. And it was going to be on this board agenda. The reason why we implemented it before discussing it and me getting your direction in a public session was because county council advised that we do it based upon all of these complaints to the district attorney's office. And if I may just expand on that a little sure. bit. The advice was because we recognize we if with public comment um, set up administratively the way it was remote the remote public comment that the district was living in this gray area. And so as a lawyer, <laughs> we don't like operating in the gray area. We like operating in what we know is the right in is in accordance with law. And so that is why I said if you know if you go ahead with the next board meeting having remote public comment, you know that you're doing this possibly in this gray area violation of the Brown Act, or you can Im implement it immediately and know that you are in complete compliance. So I guess my next question is for the superintendent. Um, if the board asks you to bring an item to the agenda for an open meeting at which you have a full board to discuss an item, why would you go with the advice of county council where no other board member has that or public has that input on an item that directly affects their ability to do their job? Myself as a public official and the public for the ability to participate in these meetings, especially with the items on this, these agendas, which are so important that our people here in our room today who will be speaking on agenda items later. Clearly, the public has spoken on these items in the past and will be interested in speaking on them today and in the future. So why you would put together an agenda that clearly circumvents the public's ability to participate in the public process. It's not an issue only of policy, but procedure as public officials. So my question in terms of the gray area, while I understand the legal argument behind it, my, my question would be why you would implement this approach instead of looking for an alternate approach to provide public access while responding to these complaints. Because the complaints, I can't imagine were saying that they did not want virtual access unless that's what they were saying. Any complaint around accessing public meetings generally means the public wants access or more access or equal and uninhibited access to just simply speak without being identified. And so that, those are the solutions that I would look for first. If tonight is a trial for that approach, then I think we can consider what kind of public comment we receive tonight on these issues and we can move forward from there. But I would, I would pause before accepting and implementing any policy recommendation like this before moving forward in any public meeting. And I suggest that we immediately return to providing virtual access, but with more responsible guidelines that make sure we protect not only the identities, but the preferences of our public to participate in our process in hybrid ways, both virtually and in person. So my suggestion to the board is, um, are you, can we ask for a process that includes the public virtually, or are you saying you no longer want to hear from the public virtually? So I think you asked me questions, yeah. but then you mm -hmm. answered because, so I'm, I'm not, sh you asked me multiple questions. They are questions that I had previously answered why I did it. Um, the reason that I feel was clearly stated was this board at a study session talked about COVID meeting procedures that have been put in place due to COVID and whether we wanted to continue with them. We talked about going back to in-person public comment only, which has been all along the advice of county council. For, for boards that were meeting in person, all along county council's advice was that public comment should be taken only in person. Um, so we had that conversation and decided. And I, I'd like to add, we yes. also, part of the conversation were the items in the summary at one and two about, mm -hmm. you know, lifting, uh, not, not, yeah, not requiring proof of COVID vaccination or negative COVID tests and also the issue of allowing student trustees to remote in due 
due to spikes in COVID. So that, that was also part of the conversation mm -hmm. that fell under board meeting COVID procedures. Mm -hmm. And between then and now, we already decided we were going to put that on this mm -hmm. meeting. Mm -hmm. But then, um, but then the question of uh, all, all of the complaints about us in possible violation of the Brown Act came up, and then the the, the um, you know the advice of counsel was, let's not let's not be uh, let's not violate the Brown Act Brown Act if we could if we're even close to that let's not take a chance, and so Superintendent Presta as superintendent took the advice of counsel. Mm -hmm. And I will also add that we have looked at multiple yes. ways to make it work. Our IT department spends lots and lots of time on all this stuff. And there really is not a way to not require information from people and to have us be able to navigate public comment in a way that makes sense in a board meeting. So we have spent a lot of time and um, feel that, this, it, that there really isn't a way to do it in a way that makes sense with our current setup, with the, with the um, technology that we have at our disposal. So I'll, I would simply state that um, we know for a fact, Superintendent Preston, that the technology does exist and other cities and school districts are using that technology. So I will forward those school districts or, and or cities and based on that, would you be interested in using their technology to be able to do it responsibly in accordance with the Brown Act? So it's not up to me. It, we're not, we're in an in-person meeting. We're not, though, I believe that the, that the districts and the municipalities that you're referring to are not. They're in hybrid. So we are in an in-person meeting. And with an in-person meeting, we are unable to do that. And it was the... Um, the discussion of this board at the study session to go back to in-person comment only. So I serve at, your, at the will of this board, um, but the discussion at hand is to follow advice of county council and to have, as we are in in-person meetings, have only in-person comments. And that's my recommendation to you. And, and I hear that. I would say that um, we have been in-person for well over a year now. So this is not simply an in-person meeting that requires in-person comments. We can have hybrid comments with meetings, public officials who are also in person. Los Angeles has been doing this. Other cities have been doing this. Can, my can, question no, is, well, you've been talking you be, a lot. Can no, I, can my I, question is can, still, would, I haven't been required. I know, but you've been talking no, a lot. No, 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 I have a question that hasn't been okay. answered though. I mean, okay. people can answer it. So my question is, if I forward you examples of public agencies which are doing this in accordance with the Brown Act, will you be considering, will you consider changing the policy back to hybrid to be able to allow our community to, to participate online. He answered that already. He answered that. I answered it. The board has decided yes no to have in-person meetings. It's not it. whether she I will, dis it's not for me to okay. decide. Okay, so then my second question to follow Can up on the board okay, is, okay, you know what? would you gonna, yes or no? No, 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 no like I'm gonna to give, I'm gonna yeah. let Ms. Sullivan please, Dean please, speak, yeah, go ahead. please. So I am also for having our public meetings as public as possible, but this was before we received and you're not included on the emails, multiple emails every single day complaining about how we do the Zoom process. So yeah, before when you were talking about when we were, we were open, it was because we weren't having somebody email every single public entity in the state of California about how we're holding our, our meetings. So for me, it did change. So in asking county council, like how do I check if a person has spoken, I'm not allowed to ask that question. How do I check if, if they dial in? How do I know that they've gone to another phone call? Can I ask? You cannot ask. When we're in person, you can see this person has spoken. They don't get to speak again. It is impossible to do that over the phone. It was really hard to do that over Zoom and not be able to check any, any type of credentials or anything to say they've already had their three minutes and now it's on to the next person. And Brown Act prevents us from doing any of those other things. So it was really hard for me as clerk to manage the meetings and then not do something that was putting us further in the violation of the Brown Act. So it, it was also the management of it was hard. I, if, you, if, if you can bring some other things to have us look at it, and if it's, it's easier, but to me it's like the things that everyone else is using is Zoom. 
And in order to do a Zoom meeting that is controlled, we have to do webinar. And to get in part of the webinar, you have to register with the email. So that is the grade that you're talking about. Even if you're doing the phone, to register for a webinar, you have to give your email. So it, it still puts us in the gray. So that's where I am on this. I, no, none of us want to inhibit the public from being a part of this process. And I don't like that you constantly paint us that way. I'm trying to do this so that we are not in violation of the Brown Act and still, like, you know, as get as much public comment as possible. We have YouTube. People can watch us on YouTube. People can email us. People can call us. My cell phone number is on my card. Mm -hmm. I give it out all the time. People stop me in the street. Anytime there's a discussion where people want to make their voices heard, this room has been packed. We've had the Galleria be packed before. People come here and tell us when we're doing something that they don't like. They email us. When we were making decisions about whether the school should be open, closed, et cetera, during COVID, we received tons of emails from parents from all over the place. So there are still ways to get a hold of us. I do wish we still had this option, but for me, it's I don't see how we do it and not violate the Brown Act until, as our county council has stated, the laws for the state of California are updated to match the technology. And that's all I have to say. And um, I, I am just going to speak now. So I know that we had this discussion a long time ago and that we decided we still, even though we're in person and we had talked about, well, if we're in person, let's have public comment in person. But we all decided, we discussed it, we all decided, no, let's have that Zoom option because we do engage more. During the pandemic, we engaged more with the public in that way. But now, because of complaints to the district attorney's office, we're forced to do it this way, go fully in. There's, it, we are not hybrid. That's the bottom line. We're not hybrid. We are in person. If we continue to do it this way, and this is, a, we have exhausted every way to try to continue with a, with a remote public comment, but it is so, we're possibly in violation of the Brown Act. We can't take that chance. We're a government body. So we are not, we are in person, we are not hybrid. So as, as was clarified, we don't, we, there's no requirement that we offer um, remote public comment. And I will, I will we, we really have to move on from this because we have many action items ahead of us. Yeah, that's part of my, my comment is why would we stack an agenda with action items that are very important with no public comment <laughs> and no access. But the, my last comment is this. One, we were in hybrid last meeting. So to say that we are in person was a decision made by somebody. So I would like to know, um, because it, the county council cannot make decisions for a school board, but can advise. Who made the decision in our district to say that as of this meeting, we would stop having that? Who made the decision? That was answered. So, Superintendent Preston, uh, this is your decision? Yes. Thank you. He emailed us. I want that to be clear. Yes, no. First of e all. Emailed all of us. Right, no. But this, no, no. But there's I forwarded the email from county council to you, the board members, which with her advice, I consulted with President Tejada and Vice President Lee, and I made the decision to follow the advice of county council. That was the answer to the first question. Great. Uh, thank you for that. You're very um, welcome. Yes. The second is, the, the, my last point is this, is the technology does exist, one. The rest of the state of California is not in violation of the Brown Act when they find viable ways to do this, which we should be following and looking for as well. And I think send with regard to us. So I, will, we'll I will send it. And like I said, what I'm saying is I would like this board to, I would encourage this board to consider viable options for promoting and encouraging civic engagement rather than discouraging it especially as the pandemic is not over. And we want to encourage our student trustees to participate, their families, our community as a whole. And I want to say to the school district, if you, are in, if you are interested in engaging, you should not have to feel like you attend these meetings in person, at least not until we have a safe way out of this pandemic and a way to okay. engage equally. May, may I add done. one more Thank thing? You. I just want to be very clear. Yeah, please. Public comment is welcomed and allowed. Right. Yep. Please come to our meeting. There's several people in the meeting today who had ample opportunity to do public comment. We've got blue cards here that do not require people to give personal information that's identifying to them. So we are in compliance with the Brown Act. 
We would love for the public to come to a meeting. Or you can email us. People can email, email us, us anonymously all the time. Yep. Mm -hmm. Multiple times a day. And yes. Just one thing to add, I know you want to move on, is that Superintendent Presta, the public comment and how it is administered is an administrative decision. Um, and that is why Superintendent Presta, through you know, discussion with the board mm -hmm. at a previous meeting and then through passing on my email, made that administrative decision. It's not actually required. There's no right. board meeting required. There's no mm -hmm. action required by the board. There's no discussion required, but as Superintendent Presta made clear, she wanted there to be board discussion, but it's mm -hmm. not required. It's an administrative function of a board meeting. Thank you. Um, before we move on, I just wanted to clarify, there are two other items um, that I have recommended and, you know, mm -hmm. seeking your direction. As long as um, those look good, then at the next board meeting, we will start um, by not uh, requiring the proof of uh, vaccination or COVID test to attend the meeting. And, and if a student trustee needs to um, call in remotely, we can, you know, figure that out. Okay. okay. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Thanks very much. Now on for, to our action items. Thank you, Ms. Beltrami. Yeah, thank you very much. Now for our action items. The first is um, our draft governance handbook, which we are going to vote on. Um, this was, this was uh, prepared in two separate all-day uh, study sessions with uh, governance sessions with Luann, Bur uh, Luann Rivera, mm -hmm. our consultant with uh, CSBA. And um, I think that the handbook uh, at, uh, properly represents what we discussed as a group, and I would like to have a motion to approve it. So, move. actually, before that, we should probably discuss it, given that you can discuss it. We were go right ahead. We have a question. Yeah, I would ask. Well, first, I would like to hear um, all of our all of that discussion from the school board. I want to be the first one to speak. If I speak a lot, then I would like to hear other trustees' stance on this first. I'm fine with it. I'm we, fine with it. We, we discussed were, we it at the Saturday. I don't we, have anything we, else. Yeah, either. I don't have anything else either. We spent five hours on that Saturday a few weeks ago, and we spent five hours back in the fall on this. We're good to go. I think one of the main points was that the agreeing on the understanding of the comedy of mm -hmm. ground and the unity of purpose, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. that we are a board. We're not. Right. We serve as a full board, and that we're all members of a board. And that when we decide something that we all need to get on board with it, that is part of being a board member mm -hmm. and that you do not continue to fight a battle that has already been voted on by the majority of the board. We need to have unity of purpose. Right. Um, I would like to clarify, you know, unity of purpose is a phrase um, that the California School Board Association uses to describe um, working together as a collaborative governing body, um, which is what we should be doing. Um, I can say this, that in many ways over the past couple of years, and in looking back over many years, I've been marginalized on this board by the board members. So I, I actually feel no unity of purpose on many issues with many of other trustees on this board um, in terms of climate justice, in terms of many aspects of social justice, um, even at some points around issues that I thought we might have unity of purpose. So, I do believe that while this um, should be there, the moral imperative should be to listen to our community first and be public officials and follow the oath. Well, you were there during the first um, right. study session right, when we discussed the unity of purpose, and I right. uh, would would direct you to page three. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would hope that you still you still agree with that unity of purpose. I, that is about aligning the LCAP with their equity statement, finalizing the equity policy retaining staff, ensuring that staff and leadership are reflective of the community, updating education facilities to ensure a 21st century education, and maintaining a high standard of fiscal responsibility. That's what our uni unity of pur purpose is, and that you were there and we mm -hmm. crafted that together. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, I'm, I'm saying that the governance handbook as a whole, actually, can we pull up the actual handbook um, so that we can see it on the screen, so the public can see what we're approving? Um, can we please pull up the attachment, the draft governance handbook? Yeah, that's, I, I don't have the oh. controls at my desk. So can we um, pull up the part about 
a board agenda items and bringing on board agenda items. What page is it on? Um, can we look? We can do a simple search. I don't have it in front of me. You have a laptop. Can you look? No, my laptop's dead. Can we pull it up on the screen? It's already up on. So, Jake, I think he just wants you to um, on page 11. Page 11, um, page 11, 11 of the Click of on the, the PDF, PDF above the PDF. Um, sorry. Where's the actual handbook attachment? There's it's, an attachment. I think you have, yeah, there it right is. Right above summary, yeah. I think if it you is. just click on the attachment and you want him to scroll down. Page, page 11. 11. Page 11. It's okay. A little further down at the bottom. There it is. Right there. Right there. Okay. There you go. Alright, so um, I'll just read it off here. So in terms of developing a board agenda, um, I want to make, make it clear because I know I've requested several items for our board to consider over the past year. Um, we have not seen all those, you, those items in a timely manner. Um, that the, what's agreed to here says every week the board president and vice president meet with the superintendent to review and develop the upcoming agendas. Items reviewed are items placed on the macro planning template by the executive cabinet, future agenda items proposed by board members in meetings, and items emailed to superintendent by members of the community or the board. Priority is given to items that are time sensitive, items focused on district slash superintendent goals, school and student presentations. And it goes on to say that um, when a board member requests a future agenda item during a regularly scheduled meeting, the board will direct whether the agenda planning team will place the item on a future agenda. Um, and it goes on to say that the items will be considered by the agenda planning team within two months or in accordance with the master calendar. So I guess my first question would be, um, was this being followed prior to this being developed, or is this what's being developed now? This is what we're voting on to do. This is yeah. what yeah. we're yeah. voting on now. Added. So the yellow parts were added. They were added. Thank you, mm -hmm. uh, Superintendent. Press. Um, that, that part, to me, I think is important because I understand that there is a level of discretion that comes with what we should do and when. Um, and I do understand that there are priorities in our district. As an educator myself, over 10, 15 years, I can say that there are a lot of priorities in education that fall off and that we have to reevaluate and reassess our priorities. Um, that said, I feel like a lot of things that I've brought up to be considered on our, on our agendas are not being brought up in good faith. And so, um, and, and we've noted this, not just myself, but other trustees, that you know, some of these issues require more immediate attention. We're at March. You know, this is our first year back in person. Granted, um, the school year is not over yet. But it is, in terms of our school board meetings, it nearly is. And so as we're passing this policy, I wonder if some of the items that I've brought up or the community has brought up will be addressed. And I don't understand. I don't know all the, the items that are being emailed from the community. Um, I don't see all the emails apparently that all of you do. But like, whatever you're getting, is, is this going to actually be, are, are these items being screened so that some items are not going to be brought to a future meeting? Or it says every yes. item is going to be brought. If you would, if you suggest it for a future agenda, it has to be brought within two months, or in accordance with the master calendar. So this is the reason why I'm talking about it. Is, is this is what was my suggestion, in talking about the things that you were talking about before, like you brought this up before. Mm -hmm. if the accordance with the master calendar is if it's if we're talking about budget. And we know we're going to have the LCAP study session. Right. That we just have the LCAP study session. But everything else has to be discussed within two months. And we purposely did that so that, so that we would memorialize a process because mm -hmm. we realized we didn't really have an appropriate process for that. Yeah. So we did this with you know, keeping all board members in mind. Right. Really listening to the feedback that you've been given. I appreciate that. So I'm wondering, um, yes, as part of that discussion, um, Given that this is being finalized at the end of the year, will some of the items that have been raised by all of us as board members be addressed before the close of the school year? Yes. 
So all of them, all the, all the items that we propose as future agenda items, we will be hearing between now and May. That is, May. that is the plan. Especially since we're going to be approving this tonight. Yeah. 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 Because this is our new policy moving forward. As right. a, uh, This is part of what we do as a board now. With, when we approve this, that means it's not just the agenda, but everything else that we've listed in here is really part of what we have to adhere to as individual board members. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Yeah, that's one thing I wanted to make clear. The second part is I understand the board president, vice president, superintendent are included as the three decision makers in terms of determining what board agendas are. Um, I just want to say that um, if, if anything, we can't simply um, decide things in, in such, I think, we can't decide things according to this all the time because there are five equally elected public officials on this board. So if there are, for example, items that, you know, want, that should be raised in, people believe it should be raised in regular session versus a closed session. Closed session is very specific in terms of what we should be doing. So there's a law around that already. I don't think we should be at our discretion saying, hey, you know what, let's just put this on a closed session agenda. Um, anything that does not meet the requirements of a closed session agenda should not be placed in a closed session agenda. They aren't. They aren't. Okay, so then I guess my question is then why do we include this part on the part of, towards the bottom of page 12 or third from the bottom says the board president, vice president, and superintendent shall decide whether an agenda item is appropriate for discussion in open or closed session, whether the item should be an action item subject to board vote or an information item that does not require immediate action. Because there has been disagreement in terms of what constitutes a consent agenda item a discussion item and an action item at prior meetings. And so I feel like we should work in best practices with the law to understand exactly what is necessary to put on a closed session and what is necessary to put on an open session. And that, that's, just, that's pretty clearly outlined in the law. I'm just confused. I think um, maybe I'm not understanding your question. I think that what this sort of um, outlines and mm -hmm. modifies is just really being explicit about the process. So process. when we're setting, when we meet each week and we talk about the different items that, you know, executive cabinet is placed on, the business items, just the things that need to happen in a timely manner. And then there are additional things that we talk about putting on. There needs to be some sort of process by which we make the decision on where to place it on mm -hmm. the board agenda. Mm -hmm. We're certainly not going to, you know, ask every, you know, do a poll each week. Where, where do we want this? So it's really about efficiency, mm -hmm. I think. So I think, is that answering your question? And I think to your point, that's why I look at the macro calendar, mm -hmm. right? So in the macro calendar, if I have a question about why is this enclosed, I just email Tony and ask every single time she gives me an answer. Like the reason why this is enclosed is because it's success, this confidential item or whatever. So the, the macro calendar is a good guide to check it every week. And you could see they really good about putting things in their advance and where they're going to go on the agenda on the agenda. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think just my, my general concern is this, is that, um, like, I mean, just citing the, on one of the last ones or the first one on page 13 is any board action that involves borrowing $100,000 or more, et cetera, there's a government code that accompanies that. And so my concern is, such as that is cited, every one of these policy recommendations should be in alignment with government code, which I believe course, we're doing yeah. our best to be in accordance of. However, is my observation that many actions of the board have not necessarily been in alignment with that. So in terms of this, setting a bar for what I'm doing moving forward. May I interrupt you? I, I don't understand what you just said. You just said that many of our actions have not been aligned, in line with government code. Is that what you said? With these recommendations. Right, here, but we're voting on them these today. These are new. These are new. Yeah. So no, we're what, voting on them now. Because what I'm saying is these new policies that we're recommending should be in accordance not only with government code, but with what actually they're saying. Because a lot of the things that these are recommending are things not only that haven't been followed, but that I'm concerned as of tonight's meeting, given our current agenda of action items, and um, just in general, the lack of, of input from the community that, that we're not actually doing our best to be in good faith with what we're asking for here. So if we're going to approve this, I not only will expect every board member to be following this, not only in word, but in deed, but I also will expect that we're actually observing the actual Brown Act in accordance with best practices, as we discussed earlier. We I think all we all plan to do that. We to all be. expect that, and that's why we put this together. And I really think that the best way to do this as a board member is to make sure that you're doing it, right? Yeah. So I think instead of constantly worrying about us, 
you know, that you would read the whole thing. And if you're saying, I plan to follow this, all of it, and I suggest that, you know, all of us follow the whole thing and not just pick, this is the one I want to follow and this is the one I want to beat the board over the head with while I ignore the whole rest of the document. Well, I don't do that, but what I'm saying is... I mean, we can pull out a couple of things. I mean, all of us have issues with some of the things in here. And so that's why we created this, so we could all get a recheck about where we need to be as board members. None of us are perfect, and there's things in here that all of us need to adhere to, and that's why we spent a whole Saturday working on it and putting it together. Yeah, I was at many of those meetings. It wasn't the last one. Um, I feel like there were comments and actually statements made at prior governance um, trainings, which were not only inappropriate, but in violation of many of these things that we're asking for in good faith. So um, I am worrying about the entire board because in offering my leadership to the community, I'm not just one person, I'm part of a team. And if we're a governance team, the governance team here in our district, we should expect the same level of fidelity with the law and with best practices and governance instead of we're trying to... We're all in to... fidelity with the law, Nick. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I've, I've heard, I've heard, I've heard, I've, I've heard and seen things that are not necessarily consistent with that, just Salahuddin, but I hear you. And, and I want to say that moving forward, that any part of this that's inconsistent with best practices and civil rights and, and, and civil liberties should be changed. This is a living document, and whatever we report, uh, approve tonight, while it is our policy, should be observed in, with respect to evolving public policy, well, which item. is if very real. Action item, if you see anything that you feel is in a violation of civil code, call it out. But right now, this to me seems to be, as we created with a member of CSBA who knows this policy in and out. And we... Yeah, and we, we also referenced board bylaws and right. I mean, our existing it in law. Right, so, right. And, 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 and it's an existing law is quoted in the doc. Yes. So if there's any item in here where you, you're seeing as an issue, that's why it's an action item right now. Well, I can see right there, it says consent items, items that are routine, non-controversial items. I've seen contracts on our consent agenda which are controversial and in, are questionable. Okay. I've, I've been the one to pull those from consent multiple times. So right. I will say, I will say this. And that's you, your that right I will expect to. moving forward that that's your right to. to that. No, and that's well, your well, right we, to. We because have, it's, we have, we have highlighted I know board that. members should contact the superintendent in advance if right. they have questions on any agenda item or if they wish to pull an item from the agenda. Right. It's here. It's right there. If we were to scroll up just a little bit, you'd see that at the bottom. Oh, I know it's there. If you were here, if you were here for that Saturday session, Nick, you would have been able to have a lot of input into all of this. A lot of this, I did have input at the first session. That first Saturday session, there were clear violations of many let's, principles not, in this. Okay, let's we're, talk about okay. the first session. It is let, all about uh, both let, sessions. You just brought it up. So my point is this, is I, I will simply expect this board to respect its own policy, right. and I'll expect yes. it to move forward. And, and say great. Of course, and That's we great. expect all, right. all of us, including you, to, to follow the policy. But I will say that non-controversial, the definition of controversial here is that if, a, if the board, the majority of board approves an item, it is not controversial for the district. That is a very definition of non-controversial. If an item has been, if a project, a curriculum, et cetera, has been approved by the, not, by the, by the majority of the board, it is by definition non-controversial. To me, non-controversial. Right, by but that's to you. I'm talking about board policy, oh. board law. Well, that is the definition of non-controversial. You may have a problem with it, as you've shown with the, with the specific things. Mm -hmm. You may continue to have a problem with it. Mm -hmm. But the definition of controversial and non-controversial is the majority of the board has voted on it. If you talk to anybody that has anything to do with board policy, they will tell you that, by definition, that makes it non-controversial. So you will see items on the thing that you don't agree with, right. sometimes on consent agenda, that because you do, just because you don't agree with it doesn't make it controversial. You know what, that's one point that I only agree with partially, is that if the public considers it controversial, it's controversial. Right, but so it's, it's, to call something non-controversial in terms of what the board thinks and not anybody else is almost a complete contradiction of democracy. So it's not a contradiction what, what is of controversial democracy. in our society is something that is by definition controversial. It's it means not. people are arguing or debating or dialoguing over that issue and okay. require decision-making processes to include All right, them. I'm going to, um, we've had healthy discussion here. I'm going to call for a vote, and then I'd like to take a brief recess, okay? Move to approve the governance handbook. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. So I'm going to call like a five-minute recess.
back from our recess. It's 9.37. Now we're on to the for, on to human resources, job description of the college and career program specialist, Ms. Luhan. This evening, I'm bringing before you a job description update. Um, what it does, or it's a new position, what it does is it we reviewed the career and the college and career teacher on special assignment job description. And we analyzed the responsibilities of, of the teacher on special assignment job and realized that there's a lot more to it than a traditional teacher on special assignment. There's budget management, and as we heard from Ms. Shreve this evening, program coordination, and quite a lot involved. And so upon reflection, we decided that it would be appropriate to create a new job description, a program special, um, <coughs> To approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. And uh, let's see. <clears throat> now on to our second interim report for the 2021-22 budget. Ms. Van Raphorst. Thank you, President Tejada. Good evening, everyone. Uh, before you tonight is the 22-23 second interim report. I know it is late, but I'm still going to go over a couple of highlights of the report. Do I have control? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so um, please go ahead and stop me along the way if you have questions. Uh, as mandated by AB 1200, the second interim report covers July 1st through January 31st of this school year. And as outlined in the documents, um, I am showing that we would have a positive certification for the second interim report, and that's what you would be um, acknowledging in your action item, is that we have a positive certification. So just um, real quick, the comparisons from first interim, we do have updated tax projections that show a little bit more income than we expected. We have an increase to some of our grant funding um, that Ms. Baca has been sharing all the plans with you. And uh, we have a salary increase that has been implemented. So those are the main changes from the difference between our, second, our first interim report and the second interim report. And you could see that that does, as I projected when we approved the raise, it does reduce our reserves um, in the current year. In the multi-year projection, um, I just want to point out some of the major assumptions. We are assuming that we will have um, tax revenue that is still increasing, um, although I, I think these are hopefully conservative um, estimates, but we'll keep an eye on the projections from the county. There is no increase to employee compensation beyond what we just gave. So for 22, 23, and 23, 24, there's no increase um, projected in those years. The retirement benefits are increasing substantially uh, unless the governor or the legislature decides to do something different. It'll be about a $900,000 increase just in one single year from this current year to next year in just retiree um, contributions sisters and purrs. Uh, we are budgeting for inflation rates for goods and services um, based on what is in the uh, school services recommendations. And we do have debt service that we will need to start paying on our C COP funds in 22-23 and 23-24. The payment for the, the repayment of this, the COP funds is um, pretty st stable after that. It like gradually increases, but it doesn't go over like 350000 in the next 10 years. So, it's, it's, so what we're contributing in 23-24 is kind of what we'll, we, we will need to contribute ongoing. And uh, this also reflects that our COVID relief funds will be expended at the end of next school year. With that, uh, those assumptions, we see that we are deficit spending. You can see the deficit for the current year and for the following year. 
but then we are close to a balanced budget in 23-24. So when we gave the 4.7% increase, I let you know that we would be deficit spending for a little while and that um, our reserves would go down. So as we've discussed before, um, we like to compare what our projected tax revenue is compared to our LCFF formula, um, just to see what the like at risk funding, the theoretical at risk funding would be. And you see that this does um, continue to grow, the gap continues to grow. And that is because, um, primarily because we have uh, declining enrollment. And um, in 22, 23, you know, when, when you figure out the ADA for the LCFF fun funding, they take the um, previous year or the current year, whichever is higher. And so you like hit a cliff. And so that's what's happening in the 22, 23 school years that our declining enrollment is making our LCFF formula stall. You can see that it pretty much stays even, even though there's like a 5% increase in the LCFF formula, it's because of our ADA. And so that means that our in continued increase to our tax revenue makes the gap bigger. Uh, so the next graph just kind of compares our re reserve to our gap. Um, the gray bar is our reserve that includes our fund 17 special reserve. So for the current year, uh, the gap is about 16 and a half percent and our revenue is about 11 percent. I'm sorry, our reserve is about 11 percent. So the at risk money is small. Uh, it grows in the in the coming year. But it is not, you know, I say it's at risk, and, and I think when we were closer, it was more at risk. Um, now that our tax revenue continues to grow, um, I think that like seeing a de decrease of $10 million in one year is not likely. You know, it, um, we may see, a, if we were to see a decrease in historical times, we've only had one decrease in the last 15 years, and it was um, a couple a couple of million dollars. Um, that I mean, being I said, think, go I'm ahead. Well, I, I just, think, oh, I mean, on this page, before you move on this yeah. page, I think the other thing that the top chart shows is like how underfunded California's <laughs> <laughs> education is. I mean, it's crazy. I don't know how we would operate on just LCFF funding. Like, how does a, how does this, how does this district operate with just that $45 million a year, that's our size. That's crazy. So I think too, like really highlighting, while this chart does show the gap and helps us realize like why reserves are important, it also shows just how low funded California education is to be in the middle of here and the cost of living. And you think you're gonna run a school district at $45 million a year is crazy with this many students. Right. Grateful right. so we're not that anymore. So. Yeah, no, I hear you. And there are many districts that are having to deal with that. Mo most districts in California have declining enrollment and mm -hmm. most of them are hitting their cliff next year. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's very dire for many districts and we are fortunate. With that uh, being said, I did want to mention that we may want to consider a board policy on reserve levels or, a, or changing our board policy on reserve levels. Um, many other com community funded districts have increased the amount of reserve that they aim for. So that's something that I can explore if the board would like me to do that. And then lastly, I just want to say that next steps, we do have a board work study scheduled for April 23rd. Um, and then we have two regular board meetings in June, first a public hearing and second for the adoption of the 22-23 budget. Um, there are not a lot of items in the proposed governor's budget that impact us. There's a lot for uh, young children, preschool, TK, early um, childhood items. There are some items that um, that impact our the LCFF formula, but for us, there's very little that will impact us. So I don't anticipate a lot of change from what I've 
proposed in the multi-year, but we'll dig deeper into it in the 22-23 work study um, in April. And then lastly, I just, because I know the board is all usually interested in this, um, when P1 exhibits just came out, so these are like official numbers from the, the various school districts on how we compare. <laughs> Even as we grow, so do they. Right. Yep. Any questions? Thank you. Yes. Very, very clear. Thank you. I recommend then that the board um, approve our po positive certification for the 21-22 second interim report. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And I still just want to say, Ms. Van Rappers, I mean, Thank you. I mean, this is, you're looking at how many other school districts are handing out pink slips right now. Mm -hmm. um, and that we've never been had to do that because you've always guided us really well and helped steer us. That is a huge morale booster when there's a district that operates in the pink slip manner, I call it. I mean, it's just a huge morale booster, even if you know you could stay. So I'm extremely grateful for all the work that you do, and thank you. I mean, again, just like I tell Karina, I show up to LCAP. I do also show off our interims, our interim summaries, uh, that how detailed they are and how much information they give in just like four or five pages. So, thank you. Thank you. Now to uh, Ms. Van Der Alpors, the J.H. Fitzmaurice additional scope of work for the Juliet balconies. Thank you. For this item, I'm recommending that the board approve a change order for JHF to add Juliet balconies to the first floor units of our employee housing. Uh, the original drawings included these Ju Juliet balconies on the first floor, as well as on all four floors. Um, and in an effort to reduce costs, we decided to leave them off the first floor. But now that the building is almost complete, it's clear that they are necessary to ensure safety and to make the project look complete. Um, the $103,000 or $103,000 that this will cost um, is with, or sorry, $130,000 that this will cost is still within the budget that has been set for this project. It will be able to be paid with the bond funds that we still have. Okay. Uh, just real quick, the work will begin after the approval of the change or has it already begun? <laughs> hasn't begun I, yet, right? I'm not sure. Um, Ms. Phillips is here. Do you know if they've started work on the Juliet balconies yet? No, they, they, they need to, they're, uh, it's a long lead item. Okay, got it. Okay, great. Move to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Are these the ones that they can't get out? Like, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can't open? Okay, I just want Clarification. Thank you, Tess. <laughs> the fake balconies. Yes, the fake. Cosmetic. That's what a Juliet balcony. It's a nice way of saying a fake balcony. Fake balcony. <laughs> All right, there we go. Sorry for people named Juliet. I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now for uh, this stormwater sorry. maintenance agreement with Daly City for 705 Ceremony Boulevard. Thank you again, President Tejada. Before the board tonight is a standard agreement with the city of Daly City for the maintenance and operation of the stormwater treatment features of our employee housing project. Approval of this agreement is a requirement for getting our certificate of occupancy. And just a heads up that there will likely be a few other items that will come to the board over the next um, few meetings that we are wrapping up with Daly City as we start closing this project out. Approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And now for the approval of the request for qualifications and proposals for affordable housing development. Thank you again. For my last item tonight, I'm asking that the board authorize the release of a request for qualifications and proposals um, for an affordable housing partner at Ceremony Del Rey. So as you know, we have received preliminary approval of our Ceremony Del Rey plan from the city of Daly City. The city council has asked that we work in good faith to see if we could increase the affordable housing in our proposed plan. In order for us to explore this, we really need to identify an affordable housing development partner. And of course, as a public agency, we need to do this through a competitive process to select a partner. 
So I am really excited about this RFP and the process it outlines because it doesn't just rely on selecting the developer with the lowest bid, but it takes into account many other factors such as maximizing the number of units that are affordable on the site, providing levels of affordability that are deeper than what's required by the city of Daly City. It includes units for community members with intellectual and de developmental disabilities, mm -hmm and it incorporates our Head Start Preschool. It also gives preference to developers with a proven track record of successfully constructing and operating affordable housing and providing tenants with wraparound services. Brookwood took the lead on putting this together. So Alan Katz is here tonight to help with any questions. Thank you for being here through all the whole meeting. <laughs> um, not only did we work with Brookwood, but of course we worked with um, legal counsel and we worked with Daly City staff to help put this together and um, in true partnership uh, with the city to come up with a proposal that should be able to meet the needs of, of everyone involved. So with that, it's my recommendation. Uh, actually, I guess I'd just like to point out that um, RFPs to be released is not a requirement that we get a board approval, but it has been past practice in our district. So that's why I brought this as an action item. Um, so I recommend that the board approve or authorize the release of this request for qualifications. And if done, um, we will release it this Friday. Okay. Uh, Mr. Ojapenti had his hand raised. Ms. Kay, I'd like to hear board input before I make comment. A question. Salahuddin. Hey, I was just going to say I'm very excited. Thank you very much. I'm so happy that we we're able to work with Housing Choices. Um, they're a fantastic organization. And, um, you know, they, they got my son in his apartment <laughs> that he just moved into last week in San Jose in a brand new uh, complex that was built in San Jose. Um, but he had to move to San Jose. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that was far away. I mean, I'm sure he's fine with it, but for me, that's a challenge. And so, <laughs> oh Lord, it's so far. And so, you know, but the fact that he had to move out of the county in order to find housing was hard. And so I'm really excited that there's going to be a portion of these homes that are reserved for adults with intellectual challenges and that more cities are really starting to look at this because, you know, cream is on the um, precipice of a wave of adults that are going to need they don't, you know, he does. He loves me to death, but he doesn't want to live with me for the rest of his <laughs> life. And I'm also concerned about, like, what would happen to me? Uh, if something would happen to me, where would he go? And he's fully capable of living on his own, taking care of himself. He just needed the opportunity. So I'm hopeful that if this, you know, f passes the final hurdle, that we will also provide that opportunity to many um, residents here in Daly City. So I'm very excited. Thank you very much for all the work. Pinty. Yeah, so um, one, I want to say um, our, we're on previous items, we're discussing the faculty staff housing project, and I think with this project, um, as I've noted before, um, and as I noted um, February of last year, um, that if any discussion was to be had around affordable housing, um, it should begin with affordable housing and not as essentially an afterthought, which is what the preliminary or precise plan listed as. Um, the city council meeting did address it um, in a few ways. One was to work with good faith with the community, which I have learned in working with the community that that process has not been followed. It has not been followed with native community. It has not been followed with our students here at Shasta who have been turned away from a garden as part of this project. These plans have not been revised at all with any community input. Um, and in fact, the same pictures we've seen for over a year are the same ones essentially we're seeing, except we're seeing it as if it's, um, as people were referring to it, clearing a final hurdle. The EIR, the Environmental Impact Report, has not even been released yet on this entire project. For, so for this to be considered, um, not only is it an incomplete process, um, I believe it's a flawed proposal. It's, it's not inclusive of our community. Um, talking about affordable housing with the caveat that we're going to look for more than 10% affordable housing when this entire board or many members of this board have advocated for the minimum 
affordable housing. No is one has advocated simply, for the minimum. It's simply board. unacceptable. At one point in the beginning of this process, members of this board presented to the city council to include the faculty staff erroneously that the faculty staff housing project should be included in the affordable housing allocation for this entire project, which is not only not possible, it's not something you should be asking a city council to do. That was the first assertion made early on this process. Secondly, this process in the language it's using should have been asking for the city to look at a project and a preliminary plan, which is tons of documentation for upwards of 25%, if not closer to 50% affordable housing mm -hmm. and any consideration of a project that might be approved by this board. The ABAG, Association of Bay Area Governments, is asking for, in its own suggestion, for regional housing needs, upwards of 25% affordable housing. That number is nowhere to be seen in this report, it's clearly not well thought out, and does not include anything from the community that has been asked, not only repeatedly at city council meetings, planning commission meetings, other city commission meetings, and in any discussion aside with our board members in a facilities committee meeting or any other side discussion. So I want to make that clear for the record that there is isn't good faith this collaboration and Trustee none of that is right. Pinty, if I could interrupt, please. I, I would appreciate if you would make one accusation at a time so that I could address them individually because a lot of what you just said is completely wrong. untrue. So completely I, untrue. I have spoken with members of our, of our school district community, our students, many of whom have protested on the news to keep our garden Mm -hmm. They oppose what you're saying and what's in this plan. That is a plain fact. Secondly, the Native community has never signed on to this. That is a plain fact. Would you like to address that first? I would like to address it. Feel that, free. That you're saying that the Native community never signed on to this. What mm -hmm. development project have they signed on to? Why is it a requirement that they sign on to it? They have also not sent a letter in, in opposing it. So... And that that's, that's what we that have is, been, that we have been told. They, there's nothing that was submitted from, in the EIR right. report right. from any indigenous um, elder or organization in opposition to the development. There has not been. That's not true. And that's absolutely true, Nick. Actually, that's to, absolutely that, that true. That is disinformation you provide that's to the public. That's not disinformation. You can look. Meeting. No, that's not. We can look at the EIR report and look at all the uh, people who have submitted letters in about it, and they're zero letters from any indigenous organization about the development. There's that is absolutely true. There has been there has been public comment letters that have been submitted by individuals who are indigenous. But if you're talking about the in the EIR report, there's a group of indigenous organizations that are listed that are recognized by the state of California. And one of those is the Roma Chichaloni, and they have not sent a letter in opposition on this EIR, they have not. I will say it, once, Ms. no, no, Mr. no, no, first of all, I'm call, I'm the president here and I'm directing traffic. Mr. Lee raised his hand. Sure, go ahead. So the item before us, wh while I understand your concerns and what you're sharing, Mr. Archipinti, the item before us specifically is, do we as a board, are we going to approve the RFQ and RFP for an affordable housing developer? That is the simple question. So my statement to that is unequivocally, yes. Because, one, this document is completely, it has, has everything that we want to see an affordable housing developer provide at such time that they are able to build something here. This affordable housing developer, whoever it may be, will help us determine exactly what percentage of affordable units we will be able to have relative to the entire development. So re regardless of whether where you sit on, on the, whether you agree with this development or not, the item here is whether we approve this RFQ and RFP. I think we should. I will make a motion to approve it. Second. Um, just would, a moment, um, Ms. Van Rapphorst. I just want to um, echo what Trustee Lee is saying is that, you know, this item, um, approval of this RFP is not approval of any actual construction um, or any approval of the project. That would come from Daly City. This is only a, an approval to solicit proposals from possible developers of affordable housing. Once we receive and review the proposals, we'll bring a recommendation back to the board to authorize an agreement with a specific developer whose proposal best meets the needs of the program. And they'll, be able, they'll be able to talk with you about how they meet the needs of the program that we have outlined. 
So yes, thank you for pointing that out. It is not any approval of um, project or construction or anything like that. Okay. Um, there's a motion in the second on the floor. I'd like to call for a vote. Actually, I'd like to continue the discussion and respond to the comments which were made. We can talk offline after. No, the this, meeting. Is not, this is a public um, meeting. This is not an offline meeting. You know meeting. This what? Is a public this, meeting. this is. This is a public this meeting. This is already, this is. No, I, no, erasure I, of native voices in our community, Kalima, is not okay. I wasn't okay. That's, that's exactly not what, what I you did. Said. I'm so not, no, 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 okay. I will address that first. Please. Call to order when that was stated, because that is a plain untruth. That is, that is misinformation. It's not. The native community has been active in this and as a steward of our garden here on this site. Okay. Since its inception and close to that. That is, so, okay, I understand that's where you're coming from. And she made her point here. Um, this is the discussion. There's a motion no, no, and a second the, on the this floor. This is a I'm You're calling. To close discussion. We're, I'm closing discussion right now discussion? because why are you closing it, discussion? because there's a motion and a second on the no, floor. But why are you closing discussion? I'm, of a I just said to item. you, I'm You're calling not following board on. Policy. I'm calling on President Ms. Tahada. Johnson to President call Tahada. for how a roll close, call vote. How can you close discussion? There on is a vote on the floor. Board item that is being discussed. Please. This item is flawed. It should not even be on our agenda. Please. There. No. Aye. And presently? Aye. President Tata. Aye. Disgraceful. That's, that's disgraceful. I can't believe you just okay. did that. I can't believe you just said that. I didn't. You're misquoting what I said. You're it's saying that's not what I said. It's on record. I'm Man, not quoting you at all. That's what not you're what doing, I said. What you're doing is erasure of our community's voices, not just our native community, but that's, our youth. You're, that's not what I said. Our, our district I'm sorry. Whole. This is not germane to, this is not... What we should be discussing at our. It is completely our... relevant to what we're talking okay. about, President Sahada. We're done. Please be we're done with. We're this... done with discussion. No, this is not, not to be discussion. discussed. We are not. We're moving on to item twelve, consideration of future agenda items. Do we have any? No. Okay. <sighs> yes, I have one agenda item. I would like to hear a community presentation on the situation around the garden which has been completely mishandled by other board members here and our school district as a whole, with the exception of myself and people in our district who have been fighting for that, students, teachers, and anybody else who feels like they're under threat of retaliation, I want to hold a public discussion as a board agenda item around the garden and preserving the garden, and I would like to hear that before the close of the school year. The community deserves that, and before any actions be taken on the garden forthcoming. To, to remove a cat's personal items from the garden to that tell high not. school students they're not welcome in the garden is completely unacceptable. And to pass something like this in light of all that is completely irresponsible. And I think it's borderline a violation of not only board policy. What are, what is, what, but, but just tell a lot me, more questions. just tell me what is the yeah. future agenda item you would like? Discussion of the garden at Santa Monica and its preservation. Okay, what's our new... Answer my direct right self. May I program yes, please. I think Christy Achapinti said before its closure, there should be a discussion. So and I it's not being closed. I'm not saying it's going to be closed. I'm saying discussion of any closure of it should yeah. not be discussed that way because that garden is, has been in place longer than most people have been in this part of this district in this room. There so was, please don't try to twist my words, Superintendent Preston. I don't appreciate that. Well, you my, do it to other board apologies. members, I so I don't understand. No, it's, she was getting a clarification you do it all the from time. you. I don't twist your words for anything. You it's all a record. Did. So oh my goodness. I, I don't understand what the agenda item I is. I don't either. Neither do I. I don't understand. So, you understand? so here, here, I'll make it simple. Preservation of the garden at Santa Maria del Rey. That's the agenda item. Okay. And I want to hear, it's a community discussion, so it should be a presentation from the community. Well, this we will hear. go to agenda planning. Yes. And we'll decide. given. We'll decide if, if it goes on a future agenda item. If we're discussing future anything agenda. regarding this topic as a whole, we should be discussing this and with the input of the community. Well, to it's a on public this meeting. meeting. So I'm moving on to adjournment. Move to adjourn. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> so we adjourn tonight's meeting in honor of Murray Schneider, who passed away on March 13th, 2022. Mr. Schneider served the JUH GSD for 38 years, first as a teacher starting in 1968 at Ceremony High School. Former longtime board member Tom Norris was one of his students. He went on to teach at Westmore High School and Adult School. In 1981, he started the AP US History Program at Westmore and later became a vice principal there in 98 and at Jefferson in 2000. He served at, as Oceana's principal in 2001 
and Jefferson's principal in 2002 until his retirement in 2006. He loved the district and the students and was a dearly beloved member of the JUHSD community. He is survived by his wife, Marcia, his two daughters and two grandchildren with one on the way. We, the Jefferson Union High School District Board of Trustees, send our condolences to Mr. Schneider's family, friends, and a host of loved ones. Get a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor. Aye. 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 Thank you.